Howdy, and welcome to another episode of Adult Onset Horsemanship. I'm your host, Daniel Dolphin. Our guest today is Mr. Mike Kevel. Mike might not be known by everybody, but he is certainly among horsemen, known as one of those horsemen's horsemen kind of guys. I can say he was very influential on me personally. He put out a video called Starting Colts back in the 90s, and one of the employers that I had got that video and had me watch it, and it certainly helped me quite a bit. I, I can remember it. We're talking 25 years later or something like that. Mr. Kevill has started Colts for the likes of Matlock Rose, Don Dodge, and Al Dunning. He has been a multiple-year judge of Road to the Horse, uh, which is where I, I kind of met him personally or, or talked with him personally for the first time back when I had thrown my hat in the ring to be one of the first wild card contestants for Road to the Horse. So, Mr. Kevill, it really is a pleasure to speak with you today, and, and I'm really tickled that you gave me some time out of your afternoon. Glad to do it, Daniel. Well, we start off everything with the lightning round questions, and these are for points and prizes, so make sure you're on your A game here. What is your favorite way to relax? Fishing or reading. Do you have where, where are you located? You're in the southwest, I know, but yeah, um the city is Scottsdale, but we're I'm closer to the Fort McDowell Indian Reservation. Do y'all have much fishing around that area? There is a river right down through the reservation that I fish just about every day during the summer. It's called the Birdie River. That's wonderful. Morning or evening? Morning. Bay or sorrel? That's not a fair question. Okay, color is irrelevant to me. It's what inside that counts. Yes, sir. Does pineapple belong on pizza? Do I have to fight anybody if I answer this wrong? You, you do not, but this is one of those divisive questions. I can't, I don't have a dog in the fight, but people have some strong feelings on this one for sure. Yeah. Well, I don't tell you whether to put ketchup on your steak i don't think you should tell me whether i should put pineapple on my pizza it it's an individual choice and if that's how your tastes are that's great for traditionalists they they kind of want to whip you if you do that but when i'm hungry i'll eat what's ever in front of me do you have a pet peeve within the industry oh my god how many do you want? All you got. <laughs> I don't know if I can remember all of them. Ray Hunt used to say, the horse is always right. He'll be the horse's lawyer, and he'll prove you wrong every time. Uh, not quite so. I, I understood what he means, but not quite so. Uh, the, people say uh, you have to teach both sides of the horse. That's not necessarily true. It's the same as you writing if you're right-handed, yet if you had to write left-handed, you'd be able to do it. It would be ugly where you could hardly read it, but you'd be able to do it, and that's because your brain shares information from the left side to the right side. Horses do the same thing. If you go to flag them or sack them out and you do either side first, the second side will be a little easier. So the brain actually shares that information. Now, you still need to work that side to make it even, but uh, the brain shares on both sides. It's, there's, We get talking here. I can come up with others, but we'll, <laughs> we'll get, get into that. Go on with your questions. Yeah, we'll get to them later. Uh, do you have – oh. Some of these I have choices on, so I customize the choice to the guest. So for a horse trainer, would you prefer to deal with a feral, wild, untouched horse and have to deal with that? Or would you rather the overly spoiled backyard pet with no respect and all up in your space trying to bite you? Which which problem would you rather have? I 
I'm still uh, all for there being a good balance. And so obviously you'd like something a little bit more in between and you can make arguments for both of them, but the feral horse, any mistakes there would be ones you caused. So that's, that's, that's a good one to do. It's just takes a little longer to, to, cause you just, the basics just aren't there. None of them. And so you just have a lot to do to get to your, place where you want to go to really start the training so but I w- i'd go with a feral horse if it was one or the other would you tell us something unexpected about you no <laughs> okay <laughs> oh well that was a question just yes or no and i answered it no <laughs> You didn't ask what is unexpected of you. And it's right. too late now. You can't go back. It's your purview. Yes, sir. You can you can have the green curtain and keep whatever behind it you choose. If you could have any superpower, what superpower would you choose? Flying. Me too. Thoughts or feelings? Hmm. You're not going to give me anything to go with that are you are, are you more a, a thoughtful cerebral analytical person or uh feelings go with your gut intuitive astrology kind of a person uh, no astrology the feelings are usually based on fact you have had past experiences which gives you a feeling of what you're going to do now and so I would rather go through the thought process and think it over. I, any big decision, I always try not to make a real quick decision. I'll take a few days to decide. The bigger it is, the more time I'll take. But you need to sure weigh it through, which working with a horse is the same thing. If you're unsure, take a break. That horse will wait. You know, just take a break and go, well, let me think this minute which way I should do. It's when we just later on when you're more experienced it's important that you react right away so because of your timing but when you're unsure just before you react and do the wrong thing just just take a second and think it through don't get out your astrology book would you say that you are decisive or indecisive <laughs> I think you're going to tell I'm pretty decisive. That's one of my favorite questions that the indecisive people usually take about two minutes to answer <laughs> and the decisive people answer right <laughs> away. But I've had two people yeah. that decisively answered indecisive. And so I, I don't know what, what we do with that. But anyway, do you have a favorite piece of tack or horse related tool? Uh um, no, because I believe you can train with just about anything. You have some things you're more comfortable with or a certain maker of a bit or saddle that you prefer. But I've learned that you can trade tools and train with almost anything because I've had to do it at different times. And it's more who's operating that tool than the tool itself. Sweet, salty, or spicy? Salty. Do you have a favorite dinosaur or deep sea creature? No. Have you ever had a UFO encounter? Yeah, but I don't believe it was from outer space. Okay, that's fair enough. Yes, that That's one of those... About 50% of the people I have asked have had yeah. some sort of a, I never thought that many people would admit to something like that. So I learned a lot by these few questions. I had something come flying through the air and hit me, and I don't know what it was or where it came from, but it was an unidentified flying object. <laughs> hit me square in my hat, which is the only thing saved me from getting stitches. So. Hmm. But as far as uh, I've never seen 
unidentified flying objects. I've never. Uh, and you're, I believe there are some, but that doesn't mean they're from another world. But I do believe that there are other stuff flying around that the, maybe they're just experimental aircraft for testing out and stuff. Maybe they're from another world. It, that's a whole nother subject. Our universe is so huge. It is, it, and it's expanding. That, that's, it, it's incredible. It's expanding faster than the speed of light. That's how fast the universe is expanding. So um, you can, uh, you can, the odds are for the uh, billions of planets that are out there uh, have other life form is very high. Having other life form that is more intelligent than us, well, that <laughs> that could be. That's not. We're not setting the bar too high. So there, there's there's good odds of that. All right. Well, did you want to yes or no on that one? <laughs> no, no, that, that's perfectly fine. The last yeah. guest I asked that of got into uh, Sasquatch. He told a, a Yeti story, so. Uh, oh, you know, okay. it goes where it goes. That's fine. <laughs> well, I'm going to award you 796 points, which is our high score so far for this game. And that entitles you to either an awkward silence or a genuine compliment. Your choice. I'll just take the compliment. Uh, they're they're valuable to me. Well. Uh, again, I'll, I'll say how influential I find you within this business. Um, and the more I get to know you personally through our phone calls and stuff, you're also one of the most humble people within the business that I have ever met. And, and I, I don't think you appreciate just how much influence some of your early videos and stuff had on some of the people of my generation that were watching that on VHS tapes and so forth. And uh, I, there's been two guests so far, you and Dr. Robert M. Miller, that I've been kind of a little starstruck with, and it took me a little while to 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 be able to talk normally and not and not be uh, stuck, you know. And both of you are are two of the most humble people I've ever met within the industry, and I I, I think that's just a phenomenal trait to have. Dr. Miller is as nice and down to earth person as you'll ever run into. He's got a fantastic sense of humor. His in-depth look at horses is uh, very valuable. Now, throughout all the pe people in the horse industry, there may be things here and there that you agree or disagree with people on. But as a whole, he's made it his life studying and writing and educating people on how to get along with the horse and the amount of work and effort that he's put into it is impressive, and he definitely needs to receive some kind of big reward for that. He's he's really a good guy. Yes, sir. And still sharp as a tack, and essentially has had three separate careers within his lifetime, all of which he excelled at. He's a remarkable man. He truly is. Yeah. All right. Well, Mr. Kevill, if you would – just for those who may not be completely familiar with you, would you kind of give us the 30,000 foot view of what it is that you do within the industry? I have pretty much made it my career basically just to start cults for other trainers. Um, I've done lots of things. I've worked for trainers, uh, for some horse show people, for some just people uh, starting colts um i've done a little bit of everything um uh, i like horses i like what what i do so i'm always interested in doing something that either i'm not very good at or haven't done um, I, I really like doing things i haven't done you know get a little taste of it and see what it is but pretty much um i wanted to be a cutting horse trainer and I worked at that for quite a while, went to work for several cutting horse people. And it got to a point where the economy took a little dive and I didn't have that many clients. A lot of them pulled out. 
and it was either take in just anything and everything that someone wanted rode or starve staying in cutting horses. So I, uh, I just took in everything and, uh, it, it's kept me busier than I ever wanted to be. I've always had a waiting list to, to work. So, but just starting a lot of babies. Oh, you get older horses, you know, that have problems and stuff like that. Uh, any, any type of training like that is fun because I see it as a puzzle and you're trying to figure this puzzle out. And if you like doing puzzles, things you have to take apart or figure out like the answer, somebody gives you a riddle. I like those kind of things. And sometimes people give you a riddle, then they'll go, you want to know the answer? And it's like, no, leave me alone. If I have to think about this for a week, I will. But it's the enjoyment of figuring it out and the joy of when you do, you, you go, yes, I got it. And horses are like that. Eventually, you most of the puzzles you've seen before. And so it's just a matter of getting lots of experiences that you can call on to handle any problems that come along. And when you have something that's a little different, that's where the fun really is because now you got to get the creative juices flowing and go, I need to take a different approach here. I got to think of something different. And uh, I've had to do that several times and nothing's worse than not knowing the answer because then the answer could be a long ways off. You don't know just how far away you are and you're just where somebody else may tell you, you're almost there. You almost got it. But if you don't see it, it, it could be a million miles away. And so sitting down there and figuring things out, then figuring out something simple for that solution is uh, satisfying. And it's satisfying because you're able to think it, but it's also satisfying because you can make results in a horse that other people had problems with. And now you get that horse turned around and let them know how they can avoid those problems. So uh, I, I like starting Colts because as a rule, most of them are, most anybody could start. There, there's a big medium in the middle that they're, they're all different, but not that far. It's the extreme ones that where you really get your experience and you learn things from. But as a rule, like I can start Colts and not really think about it while I'm doing it. I'll, matter of fact, I'll listen to podcasts or uh, uh, radio talk shows and just learn about what's going on in the world. Or uh, sometimes there's different stories that people tell or history things that you didn't learn in school. And I do that and it keeps it interesting till you come to the part where you have to think and then you shut it off and think about what you got to do. Then you turn it back on and you're on autopilot again. But I don't really have to pay that much attention on uh, on most of the day on most of the cults because they're not a problem. And I've done the same thing so many times. I understand, right? What you mean? I too like to listen to the podcasts. And do you have any particular podcasts that you're a fan of? What are you listening to, if you don't mind sharing with us? Oh, there's some. Uh, sometimes it's fun to hear different murder mystery things, but I really like the history stuff where you'll learn about the Wright brothers and flying and uh, Genghis Khan, uh, just any number of things, and they go more into depth than any other place you've ever been. And of course, in school, they touch on everything real lightly. So you can get more in depth and really fascinating things. Abraham Lincoln, all, all kinds of things that uh, are just interesting. And you learn lessons from them. And I think that's the main thing that I like about them is you, you kind of learn something. You have to like to learn. And I like to learn, and which makes me a little bit of a hypocrite because I hated school. 
I, I didn't do real well in school. I passed, but I couldn't wait to get out of class. I just, I could, I had a very hard time sitting in class. I wasn't disruptive. It just drove me crazy and I'd get kind of anxiety almost. And I just hated school, but I loved learning. And so when you're actually out in the world doing things, it means something when you learn that. So I'm, I'm real big on learning. I really like to learn about horses, but I like to learn about anything. So the, the podcast will vary. Sometimes it'll be some talk show people, uh, some comedians. There's a, a thing called The Moth. And The Moth is a podcast where people just tell stories. They have to be true stories. And they're usually pretty short, like five, 10 minutes. And they tell some type of experience that's happened to them. And some of them are very heartfelt, some exciting, some of them are hilarious. They're just, they'll have a theme and you have to tell a story according to that theme. And uh, it's very interesting hearing some of the stories that people have gone on there and, and told about. So I find that very interesting because they're quick little stories. And uh, you can, you know, it isn't like you're listening to a big, long hour format. And if you cut it off, you don't know if you're going to get back to it. So The Moth is uh, is a good one for short stories like that. But I like variety. I, I like a variety of stuff. But you, you definitely learn best when you're interested in the subject. And that's one of the good things about not being in school. Now you get to choose what you have to learn about today. And, and uh, I think I've learned way more after school than I ever did in it, for sure. Well, would you mind telling us a little bit about how you got started into training horses? Were you raised on a ranch in that kind of setting or, or did you come to it organically or how, how did it start for you? When I was a kid, we rode horses. We weren't very good. There's my brother, sister and I, and we didn't really take care of our horses because we wanted to have fun. So we wanted to run and play and we'd bring them back hot. And so they had a good solution for that. They made us ride a burrow and uh, that burrow would take care of itself when it wouldn't do stupid things. And when it was tired, it wouldn't go. And they could put us on and just walk away and leave us alone. And they knew we'd be all right. When we did ride horses, we would ride with people. And, uh, but I wasn't really, uh, it wasn't a ranch. We owned a few horses, but in high school, I, uh, I, I got more into horses and I was also trying to rodeo a little bit, and, which was fun, but it, it's a good thing I quit. The experiences in the horses I got to enjoy because it was a learning experience and learning how to do things. And it was cutting, which is where I probably got my start, but I just enjoyed there's so many things when you really, instead of just riding a horse, now you're going to train. All of a sudden, your your brain takes on a whole new, different way of thinking. And I enjoyed that. And I wanted to know more and more and more. Um, so I got more into it in high school. When I really kind of took off was after high school, I went to work for a place in Colorado they had a lot of horses and they, they were a dude horse outfit. And, but they had like maybe a thousand, 1200 head of horses and they would call old or sick or lame ones every year and then buy new ones, several hundred the next year. So there was always several hundred new horses you're going to get on. And uh, some of them were broke. Some of them weren't. Uh, some of them were problem horses, which is why they got them bought cheap. And everybody riding, we would ride them. The Wranglers would ride them before the dudes would ride them. And it turned out I stayed on a little better just because I was trying to be a rodeo guy. 
I've been around some buck and stock, and I happened to stay on a little better than other kids, so I kept getting some of the bad ones. And they weren't real bad. I'm going to tell you, I found it fun to ride a horse that bucked a little bit. But I cannot even start to ride horses that's at the NFR. Those, I'm, I'm not that kind of bronc rider. I've ridden a lot of horses that buck, but I don't know if I would have won a rodeo on any of them. You know, they, they didn't buck that hard, but, um, I ended up learning a lot of stuff from that guy. And what that guy probably taught, taught me more than anything is how to get by on a horse and how to save my life, how to stay safe. And, there was a lot of things I just thought, well, no, that ain't going to work. And he'd just say, just have faith. It's going to work. And it did. And I just learned, don't say no. There's probably some way to get it done. And so riding horses there taught me how to get by them colts and get them started and stuff. And after I quit that place, I was in between jobs. And so I was kind of helping one place out and they'd feed me lunch and which was nice because I didn't have any money to eat on. And so I'd go by to help them just so they'd feed me. And this guy says, Hey, uh, this guy needs a horse road. So I went and rode one for him, charged him $5 a ride. And he liked it. So he told his neighbor, this neighbor had two he wanted me to ride. I'm making $15 a day. I can not only feed myself, I can put gas in my truck. And I'm thinking, boy, I've, I've got this made. This is so easy. I'm just going to put a little ad in the newspaper. So I put an ad in the news. And believe me, I've been going around looking for a job. I've gone to be a brand inspector. I went to the racetrack. I went to a lot of places trying to get hired on. And nobody just needed me at that time. So this guy got me some horses, and I thought it was pretty easy. I thought, all I have to do is ride their horse, and they pay me. It what a riot. Man, I can't believe this. They're paying me just to ride their horse. I thought, I thought it was highway robbery. So I put an ad in the paper, and I ended up having to cancel that ad because I got too many horses lined up. And I would get in my truck and drive from place to place. And ride their horse, wash it off, tied up to the fence, and then they'd put it away. And I'd drive as fast as I could to the next place and saddle and ride a horse there and just do that all day long. And made really good money, but I wasn't real happy because I wanted to know more. And working for yourself, that comes real slow. And it comes faster if you're working for somebody that knows more than you. And so I had an opportunity to go to work for some people and I would go to work and learn a lot. And then after I left there, I might work for myself for a while. Then I get an opportunity to work for someone else. And I think, when are you ever going to have an opportunity to work for this good horse trainer again? And he needs somebody now. And so I would, I would just quit my business and go to work for uh, whoever it was because I just thought it was such a valuable learning experience. And it wasn't about the money or if it was hard work or easy work. It was the chance to learn something that I might not ever get a chance to learn again. And that's, that's what really drove me. And so I worked for several different trainers. And again, uh, several of them were cutting horse trainers, the guy that taught me how to be safe around a horse was a heck of a foundation to keep me safe. But the guy that taught me actually some methods and a program and timing and feel was an Arabian trainer, Gene LaCroix. And he, as, as far as all the people I've seen, and this isn't bad about everyone else, Gene just excelled more than these other guys that I think are great. He had better timing and feel than anybody I've met so far in my life. 
he was a smart guy and he made good choices, but he also had a very good program and uh, how he could get a horse to feel. And it was all very basic, just teaching a horse to give in to pressure, go forward to that bridle, soften, get collected. And he taught me to get control of every part of that horse. Then if you're ever, ever having a problem, all you had to do, because you had control of that part, you could move the hip over, get them straight, flex them, whatever you had to do, you had control of that horse. So uh, working for him gave me a, a solid program to build on. And so I think my foundation was from that guy because of his solid program. But as people go through life, you learn things and work for other people and uh, watch other programs and stuff. So I, I've learned a lot more. And of course, my experiences are different than his. Everybody has different experiences going through life. And that's what makes us, separates us from everyone else. So Gene LaCroix really gave me a program, but everybody I work for, I always made it a point. They were world champions for a reason. If you could just learn what they know and what made them a champion, whether whether you went on to do what they're doing or not, knowing what they know and or what made them set them apart for their particular discipline and what they won championships in could only benefit me. And so I work for different types of men and they were all beneficial. And uh, I, I think you could go to work for somebody and just want the paycheck and just put in your time. I enjoyed the, the learning aspect of it. And also the guys, the people I was working with, uh, other kids that were there working, that had experience before they got there and they might show you something you, you've never seen before. So, and you may or may not want to do it, but uh, it was the education that you uh, got working for all these different people. And eventually I, in between jobs, I was working for myself again and I just stayed working for myself and, and still working for myself today. So it's just, I would, I'd go to work for somebody if they, if I thought I was going to get that education, you know, it's, uh, you, you can't, some of that stuff you can't pay for. It's it's hard to get. And if someone's willing to teach you, shut up and listen. You know, it's uh, it's valuable. Would you say there's also a lot of value just in getting that many horses underneath you? I mean, I, I think the people that are trying to train three horses are that that's just a big handicap because they don't get enough experience of what all's out there so just the when you get to ride hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them there's just no no replacement for that uh in my opinion i absolutely agree with you and i'll tell you this though i would rather have a man come to work for me or a woman i'd rather have someone come to work for me that has started maybe 30 or 40 Colts, but done all of them correct. Then some guy that come in and said, I, I've started 500 of these, but they were all done poorly. Mm -hmm. So having that experience is good, but learning how to do it right, at least you know that person hasn't had much experience, but they're going to try to do it the right way. So, Yes, that experience is huge, and I think that was one of the things that I benefited from was riding all breeds in several disciplines, and uh, it was all – I've used all of it one time or another. But uh, working for that place in Colorado, I got on hundreds of horses just in one summer. Then uh, working – I worked for – a guy had uh, took horse to the racetrack, but we had uh, other horses that we rode. And his wife uh, was dressage and hunter jumper, and that interested me. 
that's where I thought dressage was just, I didn't get it. It was stupid. And then they had a clinic there with a, a guy that had been, I think it was Germany, but he had made the Olympics and he didn't win, but he was, uh, I mean, if you're at that level, you're good. And he came by and did a clinic and showed some film. And I just was floored. I just could not believe what I saw and how good those horses performed and how small of a dis- difference between one horse and the next on why that one would place lower because of some very, very small flaw. But that at that level of competition, that's how you set them apart. So I got a early education in dressage, which gave me a very strong respect for it, even though I uh, didn't care to go into dressage. It, it, uh, most horse training dressage is, is the foundation of most horse training. So um, I, I liked every discipline that I did and can't thank people enough for all the different places that I've been and worked and learned. But the quality is more important than quantity, but you got to have a lot of horses you get on. But when you get on them, try to do a little better, not only on each horse, but each day. And you can make a mistake right now and you can immediately change what you're doing and help that horse out you can make a mistake maybe it was i'm gonna try this or you just accidentally bumped him too hard but the very next time you take a hold of him you can change the training that quick you just start doing the right stuff and it'll make a difference in that horse so horses are pretty cool as far as some are better at forgiving, but you you can you can make a mistake on a horse and get everything turned around and head back your way as soon as you start doing the right stuff. But I really appreciate somebody that's got the right frame of mind in how they want to start a horse and how they think of a horse. Is it just a tool? He's just there to please you and just do whatever you want. You don't care what he thinks. If he, if he's happy or tired or sore or confused or scared, you don't care. I'm probably not the best trainer for you. You know, you might want to go work somewhere else. But if you want to learn how to avoid all those things and try to make the best progress you can with a horse, I'm I'm all for that. So it isn't about being a bronc rider. It isn't about uh, handling every difficult situation, some of that is you go to somebody and say, hey, I'm having a little problem here. What would you do? And every good trainer, every good trainer I know today will talk shop with someone he considers a peer. World champions, world champions will talk to other guys and go, hey, I got this horse and he's doing this. What do you do? Well, bring them by. Let's ride them. And they'll go over there and bring a few horses and ride. And during while they're there, they'll get that one horse out and they'll talk back and forth about what that horse would do and what he should do. And they might get back and forth on each other's horses, you know, and but they talk, talk it over and say, what would you do with this situation and this problem? And uh, so nobody knows it all. And uh, of course, if you do then you're never going to get any better. That's just, that's all the better you're going to get is what you know right now. And I also, any anyone that I really respect, not only to tell you they don't know it all, but they're dying to learn more. And I'm going to be 70 years old this summer here. And I know guys my age and older that are all still dying to learn. They're, that hunger for learning doesn't end and uh we had a really good friend and horseman that passed away uh jack brainerd he still wanted to learn you know about 100 years old he wants to learn show show him something he's he's thrilled everybody that is really a, a professional is always interested in bettering themselves so and it's always good to be better 
you know, you're never going to be perfect, but it's good to have that in a, the direction you're going, you know, and not just be satisfied saying, oh, it's good enough. Well, I am kind of curious about some of the specific horsemen in the past that, that influenced you. You had mentioned Ray Hunt and on your website, you've got Don Dodge and Matt Lock Rose and Al Dunning. I know you've ridden a lot of horses for, are there any specific memories or stories about any of those horsemen? Like Matt Lock Rose to me, I, I was in a, in the cutting industry for a, a good while. And I always viewed cutting as having two fathers, Matlock Rose and Buster Welsh. And between the two of them, they kind of trained all of the other trainers. And if you came up under Buster Welsh, you had that loose cowboy horse might be on the wrong lead style. And if you came up under Matlock, you were more mechanical and your horse was going to be broke and you were going to have control of the body parts and, and all of that stuff. And, and to me, until about 15 years ago, 20 years ago, you could still very clearly see that division within the ranks of cutting horse trainers. I think it's a lot more blended today than it was back then, but uh, I'd be curious some of your thoughts on some of those men. Now, everybody's got different styles in the cutting. You'd think, well, the horse just works the cow and he's doing what he thinks, but it's not true because the trainer is sitting there going, this is how I want you to do it. As long as you do it this way, I'm going to let you cow up and work that cow. But um, if you start to do it some way I don't like, then I'm going to fix you so you're not doing it that way. So uh, Buster was more of a let them cow up. And what was good about both Buster and Matlock is they were both cowmen. They grew up on ranches. They grew up cowboy. And they both were cowmen. And it's just that Matlock got and Buster, too, got into some of these big ranches where they were showing their horses. So they would have one horse, and they might show it at halter, and they'd show it in the cutting, and they'd show it in the stock horse class. And, you know, when you were trying to get these all-around points and supreme champion. Um, but they they were really good hands at whatever they were going to do, and smart people, two different people except for the part about being good cowmen. And uh, someone told me this, that Buster said that I, I was not a friend of Buster's. I had met him. He was a friend of Shorty's, Freeman. I believe Shorty worked for him. But Buster had come and stay at Shorty's place when we had cuttings in town. And so I was around him. Loved to hear him talk and his stories. And I was introduced to him, but I can't say I was a friend of his or anything like that. Buster said that he would, uh, like on his gravestone, he, it was something like, I'm paraphrasing, you know, he was a cowman. Not he was a world champion, fraternity, a great breeder of horses, uh, it, the best horseman. He wanted to be known as a good cowman. He, he was. He was a, a good rancher, a good cowman, uh, but he also had pretty good abilities in his horses. And he was very unique and uh, instrumental in starting a, a lot of different things in the cutting industry for the saddles, the bridles, the uh, round pen working in, lots of different things. And Matt Locke, he was extraordinarily gifted at so many things. The one thing you needed to learn is don't ever bet with him because if he's betting with you, he knows he can win. He's going to win. He was a very competitive person. And we used to joke with him like over the front of this ranch where it said Matlock Rose. It ought to have like a fishing pole and a shotgun cross there in front as his insignia because he loved to shoot birds and um, he loved to fish. And one time we were fishing, he was, this is how competitive he, he was. We had a little pond in front of his place and we'd eat lunch up at the house and a very nice lady that would uh, cook for us. And uh, we were a little early. She'd say, oh, give me, give me 15 minutes or 20 minutes. And we'd go 
fishing poles were right there. We'd just grab a pole, go out front and fish a little till she hollered at us to come eat. And we were fishing that pond one day, and I caught a nice sized fish out of the pond while I'm getting them off the hook. Matlock comes over there and takes a look at us. Oh, that's a nice fish. He said, and then throws in right where I'm at. And we're like, what the heck? This is where I'm fishing, you know. But that's how competitive he was. He thought, well, if this is a good spot, I'm going to fish here. And so I had to move on down. But Matlock continually surprised me on little things that he would tell you and show you and what he could do with a horse. And he loved the rope. He uh, he could he he would show us stuff roping. Uh, it would it, he was and he had more of a dry sense of humor. He would he he was really good, and you'd you'd think he was just being serious all the time, but he had kind of a drier sense of humor, and and uh, he would pull your leg a little bit, joke around with you and, and stuff. But uh, very very talented man on his the. American Quarter Horse Association did some videotapes in the 80s, I believe, and they did some, it was called The Best Seat in the House, and they had Matlock and Tommy Lyons, or Tom Lyons, and they showed, because they had two different styles, and they would show the cutting them as a horse they're just starting on a cow, a horse that they've worked a little longer on a cow, a two-year-old, a three-year-old, and then a finished horse. And in the beginning, Matlock, he'd ride his horses in like a little old loping hackamore. And uh, in, he, he was pretty forgiving. As uh, long as that horse kind of cowed up, he'd, he'd let it turn. It might have a little bit of a round turn. He didn't correct it. He figured that that cow was going to make him turn better because he had to get over there with it. And if you made a round turn, it took longer to get over there. So it would get better. So he didn't pick on the horse and picking on it kind of took some of the cow out of the horse because now you took his mind off that cow and made him think about you training. So as precise as Matlock was about starting him on a cow, he really let them just cow up. Later on, his horses were looked like, oh, he makes them all work this way. But in the beginning, he really turned them loose and let them play with that cow. And uh, he slowly shaped them into what he wanted. So between the two, Tom Lyons and Matlock Rose, the younger horses, uh, Tommy looked a whole lot better. His, his young colts were really kind of doing something. And Matlock's horses weren't quite there yet. But as they got going on, Matlock's horse came on. And that's what Matlock was training for, is that open horse, that uh, finished horse and stuff. So um, different styles. Eh, you know, people will have preferences, but it's not that the other person's wrong. They're just, that's what they believe. and so. If you believe my horse will work better this way, then that's what you're going to do. But you'll you'll see people with different styles, and they still achieve the same thing. I have a preference in how you get there. It isn't so much your style, but the process and how you get there. So if you're going to just beat the horse up, I'm not too strong on that, you know. But those those. Uh, Matt Locker, very good. Shorty Freeman would hardly say uh, anything. You, his whole conversation with Dave would come out there and go, Mike. And then in the evening, he'd go, well, I guess I'll go to the house. That was your conversation for Shorty during the day, unless you stopped and asked him a question. I was working in a pen right next to Shorty, and I was having problems with my horse. He was a little long on one side, short on another. and Finally, after he's working in a pen right next to me, I just pulled up and went over to his gate and waited till he was done. And when he come over there, I said, Shorty, I'm having a problem over here on the right side. He goes, no, on the left. 
no, uh, my horse is uh, just running by over here on the right side. He goes, no, problem's on the left. And I thought he was mistaken. I was the one mistaken because it showed up on the right, but the problem was from where I was on the left side. And that made me run by him on the other side. And so he had me stopping and scratching my head. And Shorty really liked it when that happened. He liked you to figure out your problems. He would answer your questions, but it's just like a horse. He would let that horse make mistakes. And if that horse was going to be the quality of horse to win the 30, he'd figure it out. He'd help him, but he like he would let that horse make a mistake. It's kind of like they said, uh, you know, uh, insan- making the same mistake over and over is the definition of insanity. Well, Matlock wouldn't keep riding a horse that kept making a mistake over and over. He'd just go, well, he's not going to get it. Needs to find another job. But uh, he was he was very astute. Even though he didn't say much, he saw everything and really had a solid program. He believed you could train a horse to cut a cow and never get him out of the trough. You didn't have to run over there and drag his butt in the ground. He, um, he, he was, he's comical. He would, he'd be working a horse and like somebody come out and go, Hey, is that, that Doc Alina son I've been hearing so much about? He'd say, yeah, well, I'll give you a little preview, but I ain't doing too much with him right now. He'd go out there and work a cow that you'd think was a final run in the finals. And you'd just go, wow. He'd go, yeah, he'll probably get a little better later on, but uh, I ain't letting him do too much right now. He's just pulling your leg. He he was showing off, you know, but he'd just go, well, I'll show you a little something. Shorty was, he was smart and uh, really understood the horse. And so he was really good. I'm curious, some of what you brought up right there. I've always felt like, of course, I wasn't there, but I have felt like that generation had a much. They were a lot more invested in the culling process and having the responsibility on their shoulders of building a breed and and a type of horse. And so, you know, it it was okay for a horse to fail and not be good enough because that was part of their job was to to find the ones that weren't. It's it's a pretty strong feeling on my part that we've, we've progressed, if you want to call it that, to a point where we're now allowing things to go through in terms of genetics that we never would have allowed to go through 40 years ago. And I think this deaf reining horse would be the poster child for that. But there are other, I I think I talked about this on the last podcast, not that you were in it, but my first professional horse job was cleaning stalls and feeding at a, a halter horse barn. And just being bored, I decided I would look that guy up 20 years later. I never kept in touch with him or anything. And, and he's now running one of the biggest halter programs in the country. And I see this poster that they have of the new stallion that they're standing. And it is the most post-legged horse I have ever seen in my life. I mean, his stifle hawk fetlock is a straight line. And I feel like there are a lot of areas now where like you were talking about with dressage where those little things make the difference. We have now multiplied a little thing that was a little better over and over and over again until it's kind of become a perversion of what it originally started as in certain cases. So do you, am I off track there? Do you have a similar feeling or? I was going to let you finish that or, but uh, yes, (laughs) (laughs) I agree. I agree with you. The horses that are halter horses, I think if you're going to make them a world champion halter horse, and this is what you're modeling the breed after, that the whole purpose of a horse is for us to use, to ride or drive, but we use them. And 
if you can't ride them, then how can you say that that is the perfect horse? If they can't hold up to riding, how can you say that's the perfect horse? So I believe that if uh, a horse is going to be a halter horse, that they should be able to and should require to do some type of performance classes. And that should weigh in on whether they are truly a model for what you want. And as I said years ago, like in the 50s and 60s, you had horses that were all around horses. They had a horse at a big ranch they wanted to promote, and they promoted him whatever he could do. And it would be halter, but it would be performance classes too. And then as we have done, we have specialized. If you want to win halter, you breed just for halter. If you want to win a cutting class, you breed for cow and confirmation there. If you're, as you can see in some of the pleasure horses, the Western pleasure horses and the AQHA, those horses uh, are completely different than horses in, say, the 60s that were a pleasure horse, where the horse's head was up. It was a comfortable ride. It was a pleasure to ride that horse around. But now they've slowed so down, down so much that uh, it's, not, I don't even know if it's a four beat lope. It, it's a staggered lope. And uh, the head carriage is way far down. But they bred horses for this. And you can see these yearlings or two year olds as you bring them in to a round pen and just have them move around there. And they've got that short stride and very soft. They hit the ground and you're going, that horse can be a good pleasure horse. For what we are showing, that horse is going to be good. But we bred for that. We kept getting better and better horse. This horse is a better pleasure. So we're going to cross them with this horse that was a better pleasure. So then you have horses that are just pleasure horses and uh, jumping horses. You breed for the same thing. Race horses, you breed for that speed. We've specialized quarter horses, Arabians. I think they call them the versatile breed, but I I think quarter horses are just as versatile because they have all the classes, every class you can think of that you would ride your horse in. As in the Arabians also have a variety of classes, um, but they're two different horses and they have two different styles and go two different ways. I rode a little Arabian cutting horse, and he was a nice little horse. And I actually showed him in an open cutting and one in there, and they made fun of the other guys I shown against because they let this little air beat him. Well, I couldn't show against the best quarter horse and win, but he was a nice little horse. So there's horses in the Arabian industry that doing things that quarter horses can't do. They all have their different specific things. But as time changed, we with our breeding program, we started specializing. But also within our horse show community, we started trying to one-up everybody. So if a low head was good, let's make it lower. Let's make it slower. And so that's how you get this, that horse morphed into what he is now, where 10 or 20 years ago, he wasn't looking like he is today. And the cutters have changed. The rainers have changed. The rainers also, uh, you see a lot of rainers with real low headsets. They actually have to pick them shoulders up to get stopped in the ground so that that head comes up some. That's great. But there were some of those horses that got in the ground behind so much, they had to lower that neck to counterbalance what they're doing. Because if that head stayed up, they would slip and flip over backwards. So now some of these horses don't get in the ground that hard and they would be balanced if their head was a little higher. But the trainers are making them put their head down low because they think it's cool. looking. So they're putting stuff on horses that they think, well, the horses that are winning look like this. So whether it's the rainers, the cutters, the Western pleasure horses, Whatever it is, they are uh, uh, the, the requirements for winning has changed over the last 50 years, as well as the breeding has changed. And the breeding, we 
I believe in a lot of ways have bred a lot of good qualities, trainable horses, very athletic horses, but also some of the horses, uh, as you said, in controlling this breeding, um, we've bred defects and repeated breeding these defects in the horses. And years ago, the horse would just die and you wouldn't breed anymore to him. Well, now you keep him alive and you have him tested and find out what he's got and what you can maybe cross him on so you don't pass it on. So you're not really getting rid of that. And you're not really getting rid of bad confirmation because if you can't go out and do a day's work, that horse isn't worth anything to you. So you wouldn't continue to breed to him, you know. So we've changed for what we're doing. <clears throat> and it all gets down to the horse should be usable. The horse should be able to go out and you should ride him. If you just want to ride and go see country and ride with friends, that's fantastic. But the horse should be able to do that and not you shouldn't be scared to death or he shouldn't get blamed from doing it. You know, the horses that we uh, end up showing, some of them I, I, be, I don't know if I can say this politely, some of them are nuts. But what the trainer has done is a fantastic job of getting them through that class. They've done so much training and so much preparation and now they have him ready. But just to go out there any day and saddle and get on him and have a good ride, it probably won't happen. But prepared for that class, that horse was the best that day. So he became champion. But we, we've just changed in how we, we do things. And, well, you got to just find your alley that you like to hang out in and uh, have fun. And that's one of my 10 principles of training is to have fun. Yes, sir. Well, do you feel like, like I have always thought that it comes down to the judging. Like there, there are multiple classes I could point out now where if you went and looked at the rule book, you have fads that are going on within the ring that the rule book specifically states aren't supposed to happen. Uh, like I know raining used to have a rule in there about the pole being below the withers was a, a you know, that was going to be a, a problem for you. And I don't know if they've since taken that out or not, but you can't find a horse in raining anymore that won't have its pole below the withers. Other things like that. Again, I'll, I'll just stick to picking on raining. It used to be that, that in the spin, they were going to be significantly judged on the the precision of the spin. So that pivot foot, if it moved more than a, a 18 inch circle or so, you were going to have a problem. Now you they're going to be 10 feet to the left of where they, they started. They're going really, really fast, but, but they're not locked down on that inside hind pivot foot nearly like they would have been 20 years ago. And, and they're, like I say, with the halter horses, we're supposed to be judging confirmation and all. I always felt like if, and, and I don't know what the impetus is to start this, but if the judges were just a little, had a little higher standard and enforced the things as they were classically written to the mission statement of what this class is about, that a lot of that stuff would clean itself up in 60 days. When, when the trainers aren't winning doing this anymore, they're going to go home and fix that, you know? And I, I have some fairly strong soapbox feelings there. But what what are your thoughts? Well, I want to address two things, and that's the reigning and the judges. The judges, do you know who the judges are that uh, are judging the classes? A lot of times they're trainers, they're the trainers. if that's what you're yes. Yes, right. that's exactly. <laughs> and the people on the committees and that are probably the president of the association. They're all trainers. And so they make rules to show off what they want to do or what they think is good or what the trend is. And so things have changed over time. So trainers have a hard time take going backwards and let's have it back how it used to be five or 10 years ago, because this is what they do now. So trainers set the rules and 
they only have themselves to blame for the horses that win because you're the one that made the rules for that. Now, there'll be individuals there that say, well, I don't like it. No, but as a group that votes for the different rules and the changes, it's the group that I'm talking about, not the individuals that um, uh, have made the rules into what they are. On the reigning pattern, years ago, in the reigning pattern, there were half turns. You would have spins, and usually the spins were just three spins. And your half turns, you'd be 180 degrees. They took the half turns out. There are no longer half turns. And the half turn is way more important than a full turn. Because if you're out working a cow and you turn 360 degrees, something went wrong. <laughs> you, something happened that, you, you know, if you needed to be way back around there, it would have been shorter to go just a step over instead of 360 degrees around. So if you're out and you sure don't, I mean, you're just a confused cowboy if you're just spinning out there and like, you know, oh, Luke's lost it again. You know, yes, <laughs> they're sir. just thinking that's crazy. So it's all about showing off. Well, if it's all about showing off, how come they don't have the half turns? My impression of why they don't have the half turns is because how they do the turns now. They used to do turns where they would run to the middle, stop their horse, and then immediately go into three spins, stop, spin the other way, lope off. Well, now they come to the middle and they sit there. They let the horse relax. And I'm not complaining because they're letting the horse relax, but they're letting the horse relax. And then they're kind of bumping them, getting their head set. And then they're getting, they start moving around, getting the head and the body shaped the way they want the leg in them. And then the first turn, the first couple steps is real slow. And then as they go around, they speed up. And so now they're doing four turns because the first turn isn't always your best turn. So they, get, they almost give you a whole nother turn to get going. And then you can do three really good turns. But yes. now some horses do, they can't turn around, just turn around. But most people, they go, start really slow and then they speed up and go all the way around. So now there's three turns or four turns instead of three, and they've taken the half turns out because if you've taught your horse to start turning real slow and deliberate, that half turn is going to be ugly. It's not going to be a big snap over here and a snap back. It's going to be a real slow walk over there. So they took the half turns away because that didn't agree with their training methods. And if you're out working, if you're sorting in an alleyway, or if you're out holding herd somewhere, that half turn is way more important and useful. And you'll use it all day long than 360 degrees. So, so yes, that's, that's my view on the reigning and uh, uh, how they do things. And again, it's just all changed to what it is now and what suits the, the judges and the rule book and the trainers now. One thing a little bit off the subject, but I definitely wanted to chat with you about was your video on starting Colts. Uh, I was kind of curious. You, you did that at a point in time when there weren't 5,000 clinicians out there and when videos and all weren't super popular. You were kind of at the forefront of that, I would say, at least as as I see it. I was a young kid back then, but what was your motivation to to do that at that point in time when it wasn't, you know, nearly as common a thing as it is today? Well, I had a relationship with Western Horseman Magazine in that they came out to Al Dunning's place and did a reigning book with him. In the reigning book, I started all his Colts, and so he. he I did in his first book, I started the cult in there to show how to get the cult started. So I was in that first reigning book in the beginning of it. From that, they asked me, would, would you like to do a book on starting cult? And I said, yeah, I would. Well, we didn't have another conversation for like a year and a half or two years. But in the meantime, I've been writing. And I wrote it all out in longhand. 
And I was down at a show in Tucson, and Pat Close, who has just recently passed away, was editor of the magazine at the time. And uh, I talked to her on the phone, said, hey, I'll, you going to go there? I'll meet you there. And I got some stuff I wrote for you. And I went there, and I shoved this notebook across the table to her, and I go, there it is, the, the cold, start cold book that we talked about. And she goes, oh, well, you know, when we type it up, it's really going to, if you thought you wrote a lot, you probably have it because you type it up. It's pretty small. She opened the book and started going through there. Not only was each chapter too long, she cut about two two chapters out. Just And at that time, it was the biggest book they had put out. And uh, so I had done the cult starting book for Western Horsemen. And that was published by them, so it was actually their deal. It's their book. They own it. I was just the one they did it on. But then I thought, well, these videos, I think, are going to go good because people like to watch things. And you can, I'd rather see somebody set a maneuver up and then do it and then demonstrate, well, if they do it wrong this way, you do that. Or Now you're seeing it in action. And I thought people would benefit more from seeing that. And so and there wasn't very many videos out there, but I just paid for it out of my own pocket. And I got a, I could have done it a lot cheaper, but I paid somebody way more money. And I thought I was just going, oh my God, oh my God, this is just, I'm going to go broke. And then Western Horsemen, I asked them if they would advertise it and they could sell it also. They told me what they charged me to uh, advertise it. And I was going, oh, oh, man, I don't know. I said, I'll tell you what I'll do because they were selling it at cost. And uh, so they got it at about half price. They were making as much money off it as I was. And uh, I said, if they don't sell, so many copies in the first three months, then I'll pay you full price for the three months of advertising. And I said, if they do sell that many, then you give me the advertising for free. And this is what happens when you're working with somebody that's not a corporation. They were all cell phone, the people that worked there. They took the deal. And the first month wasn't too big, but second month was, and the third month was fantastic. And they said, well, we, we're not charging you, and we're going to advertise it every yeah. month from now on because it's doing that good. And so the uh, videos sold really good because, like I thought, people wanted to see it in action. But actually, the book still sells a little bit, and that was made in 1990. I wrote it in 88 and 89, and they finally got it published, I think, in 90 or 91. So it's... It's fairly old. It's 30, 30 some years old, you know, but I did the book and you have to think of who your audience is. And I struggled with that. And I thought, well, probably most trainers aren't going to buy a book, but there's a lot of people that have one or two horses that would like a little help. And so I wrote it with those people in mind and tried to put a very basic, simple program in there that they could follow and get the job done. And I've had people ask me, well, do you still use those? Well, I use those things, but I use different things back then and different things now. But basically I, I, you know, that was just a basic or a basic course. That's what you do. So I would, love to do an updated version of it just because time travels on and, and you learn a lot of cool things and other different exercises that would help and that would that would be fun to do. But that's how I got there is because I did the book. I just thought, well, I think a video would be a good companion to do. So I did a video. Well that's that's pretty cool. I can um, I can 
tell you that in in 30 years time the uh do it yourself video thing the the costs have not changed I, uh that bit video i was telling you about that that damn near bankrupted me that that was way more expensive than i i ever thought that possibly could have been if, if i had had a clue what i was getting myself into i never would have done it but so i've got a few i have a facebook group that i pose uh, some questions on. I always tell them who I'm going to have on the podcast and, and get some questions from them. So I've got a few questions for you from Facebook. Uh, the first one is pretty broad, but uh, the question is, what do you think are some of the biggest mistakes that one can make when starting a cult? Well, not being able to read your horse. You see what I see, but you're not paying attention to some of the stuff I see. So once I can point some of this stuff out, you'll never unsee it. You know, you'll go, oh, yeah, I remember that. So being able to read your horse and what he's doing and maybe kind of what he's thinking, just having an idea of how scared he's getting before you have to blow up. You know, maybe you can avoid that. Uh, you want to stop short of trouble, not get into trouble and then worry how to fix it. Oh, let's let's stop before we have the wreck. I always used to laugh. Uh, what do you do for a runaway? Well, I tried to teach him not to run away. What do you do for a horse that rears up? Well, let's figure out why he's rearing up and not figure out what to do after he's reared. You know, let's avoid the trouble is the best uh, way to do it. But reading the horse if people just really take the time and look at that horse, watch him, recognize what he's doing, because that's what the horse does. The horse is the best at, at reading people and things and what's going on in their environment. They really notice stuff. So not reading the horse correctly, their timing and feel. That's something that uh, you don't be upset if you're not good. You continually work on that. And there's even times where I'm doing a good job. I still get after myself going, that could have been a little smoother. You can still smooth that out a little bit. Nobody, nobody think, yeah, understands. I quit telling people that because they thought, oh, you're, you're crazy. You know, that was fine. But I can tell. And so your timing and feel is real important. When to advance your horse. A lot of people get stuck in like the groundwork and they do something over and over and over and they have a hard time moving on to the next thing. And so when do you move on? This is, this is, I'm going to tell you how to answer that. And this answer is the same answer for almost any question you ask me pertaining to training. It depends <laughs> because there's so many variables in that. So many variables that you just can't say, oh, this is what you always do. Because just like the horse rearing up, horses rear up for different reasons. So there's different things you can do to correct that or while they're rearing up. But there isn't just any one thing. It depends. And how do you start a horse? Well, that depends. Where's he coming from? You know, what's his start? What's his past experiences? There's lots of different things in answering how to work with a horse. And so when to advance, it depends. It depends on you. It depends on if you're familiar with the next step or if you're unfamiliar. It depends if uh, it's a, uh, if you're, you're struggling at where you're at, it may not be a good time to advance. But don't get stuck in that same spot forever. Some of the best learning experiences comes from that struggle. A horse has to be challenged to learn something. That does not mean go scare the heck out of it. But you have to address those problems and he's going to be, he's going to get nervous. He's going to be confused. He's going to be unsure. Well, that's your job is to straighten all that out. Get him unconfused. Get him where he's understanding what you're trying to do. You're trying to show him, look, I'm just giving you these little bits, giving you those little bites. We'll take big bites later. Just start. Uh, the joke is a uh, little kid telling me a joke. How do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. <laughs> and 
That's what my training is, is eating an elephant. I just take one little bite at a time. Take your time, chew it up good, and uh, swallow it, and don't get in a rush, you know. That's what horse training is when you want to advance is go ahead and introduce it. If you're unsure, give it a try, whatever the next step is, and introduce it in a small amount. If you introduce it and ask a lot, you're probably going to fail. Even if the horse is ready for it, if you ask too much in the next step, you're probably going to fail. So what we do in training is we it's called shaping. And, and you just kind of get them to do it a little bit and then a little bit more. Then you start refining it. And then you really get down as they get further down the road. You really get picky and your style matters then on how you refine it to get them to spin or stop or change leads however you're going to do it. But you start with that first little step, just just starting to get them to do just a little bit and reward that. So, and that's what a lot of people will do wrong is they ask too much or not enough. And that's that's another big mistake that they do. But those, I would say, are some of the major mistakes that, that people make. Would you say that that people would probably do better if they gave themselves a little more permission to that it's okay to make a mistake and you don't have to stay stuck doing those same three groundwork exercises for the next eight months? <laughs> but I, I find people get paralyzed with that stuff. They get in. I, I even I call them rituals at a certain point where they just get stuck in this ritual, and you could see that same person with that horse six months from now, and they're going to look exactly like they look today you know and it, i think it's all because they either don't know what the next step is or they're they're just afraid that they're gonna mess something up and, and so they kind of get they get paralyzed in that little ritual and and that's the end of it you know yeah people get in that comfortable zone of doing something and they want to stay there where it's comfortable and you know the horse is comfortable there because he knows that's all you're going to do but mm -hmm. We learn, like, if someone came to me and I showed him some things, well, I showed him some things, but where he's really going to learn is when he goes home and practices those things. Because now I'm not looking over his shoulder and saying, no, no, don't do that. Not like that. Oh, that's too much. I'm not sitting there nitpicking at him, keeping him correct. He's doing it, and he'll see, oh, that was too much. I got to lighten up. It's going to mean a whole lot more to him. When he makes those mistakes and goes, God, don't do that. And, oh, look, that's working. That's good. That's good. He's going to reward himself and punish himself. And that horse, because horses are so honest, they're going to tell you if you're doing a good job or a bad job. So uh, you've got to make mistakes. There isn't anyone that hasn't made mistakes, of course. Nobody's perfect. And you, some people catch on maybe a little quicker and stuff. But, geez, everybody's made mistakes and everybody's tried things that you then said to yourself, well, that was stupid, you know, or you might say that wasn't very smooth. Let's try it again. Or maybe I better try it a little different way. But you will learn more practicing and making mistakes on your own than you will just having somebody watch you and keeping you correct. Or if once you learn it, you don't ever get outside that comfort zone it's 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 something you just have to do but just do it in little bits don't stick your neck out there and try for something really big because you know you you really take a big shot at something then the fail is really big you know you take a big chance there's a big chance you're going to fail big so try to try to minimize it and uh, ease your way into it it's big stuff. Get somebody there to help you through it so nobody gets killed, you know. But uh, uh, I think I'm, I'm the type to not have any idea how to do it, but I'm going to go, I'm going to go try that. <laughs> I mean, that just, the uh, first time I jumped a horse, it was just, we're, we're going to go over it, you know. It was just some logs on the ground, you know. And But uh, we set up uh, some tires. And then some rails we just had, and we just put them rails on top of the tires, and they hit, they'd jump 
that, we'd put another tire on there and raise it up until he couldn't jump. You know, we, we had no idea what we were doing. No idea. Uh, but we were having fun. Learning how to do it correctly, I would have gone about it a little different. So it does good to have a foundation doing it. But I, I do like trying stuff. And I'm not afraid to try things. Um, there's going to be certain parameters you want to stay in between because, you know, you want to keep yourself and the horse safe. You want to have a at least a plan what to do. Well, if this happens, I'll do that. Or if that happens, I'll do something else. You know, kind of think it through a little bit, you know. But I, I think it's fun to try things. And usually I get a little education before I do it anymore. When I was younger, I'd just go do it. I, I just... I just had that in me where I just, well, I, no, I'd never done that before, but I'm going to go try. Yes, sir. Uh, one of the other questions that we had for you from the Facebook group was on horses that get over desensitized. So there does seem to be a trend kind of tying in with what we were just talking about, about people that will just desensitize a horse to no end and trying to take every reaction out of him. Uh, I know this is one of the topics that Martin Black talks about somewhat. Do you have any thoughts or, or feelings or opinions on that topic? Yeah. Um, I have no idea what Martin said, but I'm going to make a bet. It's pretty close to the same thing. <laughs> I think the word desensitized fools people. You don't want a numb horse. You don't want a horse that's afraid of things. You want to get him used to certain things, but you want to keep him sensitive to things. And so you you want to balance that. You're trying to keep where he's light and feely and easy to move and operate. But usually what we're trying to get him desensitized to is scary things whether it's riding up next to something or swinging something around or uh, things like that. You're trying to get him where he's not afraid of some stuff. That's, that's good. That's good to get, get him over certain things because the more things he gets less afraid of, it makes him braver. And that bravery will help on the next thing that scares him. He won't be quite as afraid, and he's learned from past things how you're going to get him over, which is it's not going to be traumatic. If every time you got a horse over something he was afraid of and you just attacked him with it, then he would be afraid of every new thing. It's like if you were afraid of snakes and I walked up to you and said, hey, look at the snake. And you went, no, I don't like snakes. They scare me. And I said, oh, you just got to get used to it. And so I just wrapped it around your neck and held it on you until you quit squirming and squealing. You know, one, you're not going to be my friend anymore. And next time I walk up with something and go, hey, take a look at this, you're going to run the other way. You're not going to have any faith in, in how I'm going to deal with something that you're afraid of. And the horse is the same way. Horses, if every time they're afraid of something, they end up, one, really getting it shoved down their throat and then getting beat up because they're afraid. Now you're trying to train fear with fear. I want you to be more afraid of me to get over that. And that works because people do it. I do not recommend it. It is not good for you or the horse, and it does not help you for the next thing that the horse is afraid of. If you show them how you're going to introduce something that's afraid to them, then the next time they see something they're afraid of, they'll stop and go, wait a minute. And you go, okay, well, let's talk this over. And you can work your way where you can get closer or get over it or whatever it happens to be. And then he'll be even braver. There's lots of times where um, I had a, a friend of mine, this gal, she's got a real good program. And uh, she starts a lot of cults for people around here. And she had two Arabians that, matter of fact, she told me they just flip out. I go, well, what do they do? They just flip out. So <laughs> I'm not sure exactly what that meant, except they were definitely afraid and uh, 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 just freaking out. So 
I said, all right, well, let me mess with them and then I'll work with you tomorrow. So she worked other places. And so I'd never even seen her work with these horses, but I went in there and caught them and messed around with them. And I could see every little thing scared them. So I just did anything anybody that's ever watched some of these videos would do is you go in there and you you kind of work try to make them a little easier to catch, you know, instead of them walking away from you. Just, let's get them turn and face me where I can get up to them. You take a flag and kind of flag them a little bit. And now she was already saddling and trying to get on these horses. So she had progressed quite a ways, but they were still, and she was afraid to ride them out of the round pen. So I just did a lot of different stuff with them to make them braver. And there were things that like the tarp and stuff that they'd be afraid of, but you introduce it real slow or a little bit at a time. They get used to it. They go over it. And every next thing that you do gets better, whether it's the wash rack or anything else. So she got along with these horses. She could not believe the change in these horses. She wondered what I did with the horse the day before. And I said, oh, I just made it break, you know, but she wanted details. So she watched me and she said, well, that's not much. I go, yeah. And none of that has anything to do with riding. No bridal work, no saddle, the, nothing. It's all just making the horse braver doing things. Now that they're braver, different things they're going to maybe stop and look at, but not freak out about. So just making your horse braver. Matter of fact, that is, I'm going to give you my whole training program, Daniel. My whole training program. Are you ready? Your I'm pencil ready. ready? Yes, sir. You're going to want to write this down. <laughs> it is remove the fear, get control. That's it. That's my training program. Remove the fear, get control. If you do those two things, you're a horse trainer. You remove the fear, training becomes so much easier. The trick is, in your training, you cannot add fear. You will approach that fear. You'll deal with the fear, but you are not going to train with fear. So you cannot remove fear and then jerk the hell out of them and, and scare them into something. It, now you're mixing your training methods. But if you just remove the fear, and then you can work on getting control. And as you go do some things, they're going to get afraid again. So, okay, let's just take our time and get over this. Now that that horse is in the right frame of mind, he's so much easier to train. I am trying to write an article on having a horse in the right frame of mind to train. And it makes training so much easier. And um, it's not a big deal. There's days where people go, Boy, my, my horse is so good today. And other days ago, I don't know what was going on, but he he was just all over. He was so erratic. And they will just complain about the horse. Now, there could be lots of reasons why the horse wasn't good that day, you know. But your job is to get him in that frame of mind to learn. And if he's not in that frame of mind to learn, don't try to progress. Don't let's Let's try to fix what all those problems are because they're just going to keep coming back. And so you want to have that horse, uh, and people will say the horse should be relaxed when you train him. I don't know if relaxed is the right word because you want him to be attentive. You want him to be paying attention and go, all right, what do you want me to do? You know, like working a border collie, uh, mm -hmm. border collies, they're like, come on. Yeah, I want to do something. I want to do, and they're just jumping all over. Show me, show me. Come on, come on, come on. And uh, border collies are, are really cool. And you get some of the mother really big dogs that sit there and just look at you, pant, and you're going, oh, you want to get the ball? You want? And they just look at you, and you throw the ball, and they just look, and no interest at all. So everybody would like to train a border collie. And border collies are thought to be the smartest dog. I don't know if they're the smartest dog, but they're the most trainable dog because of their eagerness to please you, of trying to do something. They want to. They have got that motivation. And so it's the same in training the horse. You want to have him motivated. Now, if that motivation is held back by fear, confusion, um, uh, something has really uh, past experiences bothered him with that, or they had a bad uh, trainer, 
you need to get over those things in order to start your process, to have him in the right frame of mind. So don't train and try to train around those roadblocks. Get rid of those roadblocks. And then training is so easy. And that's why I say just remove the fear. Now, as you train, you're going to run into things that kind of scare them. Okay, address them as you go along. But basically, once you remove the fear, now you go to get control. Under control, there's only one thing you're going to teach. You got your pencil again? You're going to, you, yes, sir. It's going to be a whole book. Okay. okay. Under, <laughs> under getting control, you're only going to teach them one thing give into pressure. That's all they have to do. It's just that they got to give into pressure a lot of different ways. You're going to show them dozens of different ways. And then you're going to combine that. Well, give in here and give in there. And now you get a more high level maneuver that you're doing. Uh, so, but basically don't have them moving into pressure on one thing and like getting way away from it, like get behind the bridle. Don't get way away from the bridle. Don't have them leaning on it. You, you just want them to solve. And that's what you, you want when you ask them to move the feet. You know, you're going to go, well, I'm going to direct you here. Just give in to pressure and uh, you'll move the feet where I want. So that's really the only thing you got to do in uh, training is to teach them to move, give in to pressure, move away from pressure. And you're going to do it in lots of different ways. And again, different people have different methods. And some methods may work a little better for you. I would pick one that isn't volatile and doesn't uh, interfere with the fear factor in scaring the horse. So you want to keep that horse in that right frame of mind as they're learning to get into pressure. So that's, that's my whole training all together there. And I, I give that to the world that anybody can use it. It's not copyrighted. <laughs> <laughs> Real simple. I try to keep everything I do simple. It, it yes, should be sir. simple. Well, you, you touched on a word or two there that gets into the world of behaviorism. And uh, when we talked on the phone yesterday, we were talking a little about some of the research and, and the developments in that world. And so I guess we'll open that door right now. I think you had gotten a little bit into B.F. Skinner with me. I don't know if you have a particular place you want to start your thoughts on that or if with operant conditioning is where you'd like to start or <clears throat> or or what? This is the problem that most people have with when you mention like a B.F. Skinner or somebody that has worked with human behavior. They're going, well, that's for humans. And you're going, well, yeah. This is my argument. We're more alike than we're different. We have basically the same limbs. I've got two arms, two legs. They got four legs. You know, we got a head and neck. We got body. Our organs are about the same. If I took a, a pin and I stuck you with it and I stuck the horse with it, I'd probably get the same reaction out of both of you. And more important, if I tried to stick you a second time or the horse a second time, I wouldn't get away with it. You would both go, uh-uh, you ain't doing that again. We have more similarities. So when you get to comparing, they have, uh, the word is anthropomorphize. I have to say that slow to get all the syllables in there. Yes, but sir. that is giving human behavior onto animals. So just because humans have some behavior doesn't mean animals don't have that behavior too. Animals just don't have all of our behaviors. And so they don't think like we do. But, you know, raccoons don't think like birds. Dogs don't think like cows. There's a lot of similarities in all animals. And the basic learning, you know, the stimulus response is, is very basic. And that's what we really uh, base all our training on. We either reward or give a negative response to what, however we stimulated them and to get that. But people automatically don't want to look at any research done by humans on humans because it, it doesn't apply to animals. We're, those are animals. We're humans. We are so 
superior. Well, maybe in some ways, but not in others. You know, people are always amazed at how smart animals are. Just like uh, I was mentioning about the border collies being smart. There is a story done on a border collie this man had. Uh, and I believe this guy was a psychologist or something. I don't remember his story. But he trained this puppy ever since it was little and started teaching him words and things. And now this dog is known as the smartest dog in the world. All he is is the smartest trained. He's both best well-trained and he's learned hundreds of different words and understandings. And he can talk to this dog. It's, it's really a good education on what just doing the training consistently will do. What we don't do with horses is what this guy did with that puppy. You don't take that little baby and start educating him and all the things he need to know and keep him right with us the whole time. We go eat with him, sleep with him, take him with us when we go somewhere, you know, spend all our time with him. And so now we would be buddies with this horse. It's not easy to do, so we don't do it. And there's times we don't want to go out there, but you always have to feed the dog. You know, you always have to let him out of the house. So you're always interacting with that dog every day. But there's some days you wouldn't mess with a horse. But if you took a horse and you did the same thing, started educating him from a baby, you can use Dr. Miller's imprinting from the very beginning all the way. Now, you don't want to do what we talked about, one of the first questions you asked me about whether working with a feral horse or that spoiled horse. An educated horse is not a spoiled horse. You can work with a horse and have them numb to everything you do. You can have them thinking they can do anything they want, and they don't have to do what you want. You can have them completely spoiled, or you can have the best trained horse in the world. It's the same as raising the kids. You know, you, you can let them do anything they want, let them get away with bad behavior, or you can correct them. And so with the horses, if we would ever take some of those horses and start teaching them like that and showing them everything, it would be amazing how smart some of these horses would get and how much understanding they would get. But scientists would be amazed. They would go, this guy has got a horse that understands this. They do that all the time with dogs. So they'll say, dogs can read human facial expressions, and they're shocked at it. Anybody that's ever raised dogs for a while is not shocked by that and how dogs can understand things. They look at you and they see, well, when that face is made, if you smiled at them and then kicked them, pretty soon they would be afraid of you smiling. You know, it's real simple. It, it can't be they automatically know what a smile means. They learn what a smile means. So they learn certain behaviors and key words when you, you go, uh, want to go for a walk? He's excited. You know, you want to eat? He's excited. There are certain things he's going to get animated at because he's motivated to do that. So first off, you have and I have read different stuff on human research, because that's where the most research was done. And now I pick and choose where to apply that to the animals. And most of it all applies. When you get into certain reasoning power, they'll make an argument about horses not reasoning. I can make some arguments for horses reasoning, but that's that's a whole nother uh, road to go down. Uh, horses ops absolutely do not reason like we do. But I do think they have problem-solving skills. It's uh, limited, but then your skills would be limited too if you were never taught how to problem-solve. You can't say somebody's dumb because they were never taught anything. You know, So you yes. have to have that education. And you're not a genius just because you've learned a lot. You had to just really work hard and you did nothing but study that to pick it up. So... You can read stuff on behaviorism in, in, in the books and get a good grasp on just the stimulus response and how horses learn, how they react, what reward does, what punishment does, negative reinforcement, positive reinforcement. 
all those kind of things can just give you a better understanding of how horses operate. There, there was a guy that was a, a great pilot, but before he became a great pilot, he was just a mechanic. He joined the Army. Uh, he was in the Army Air Corps, and he was a mechanic, but then World War II come around, and they uh, said, well, we need more pilots. Anybody wanting to get pilot school? Well, this guy knew how planes work. He'd gone up with pilots and the feel this. And he'd go, okay, and then land. Then he'd work on the plane because he'd been up there flying it. Well, when he finally got in pilot school, he was a whiz. He was so good. And he later on became a, uh, a guy that tries new prototypes out and research planes and stuff like that because he knew the, the mechanics of the plane. He wasn't just a pilot in there going, oh, it doesn't work. I don't want to fly it. Why doesn't it work? And mm -hmm. he could tell you why it wasn't working. And so I think it's the same thing with the horses is that if you know how the horse operates and the principles behind the training, that is only going to help you on how you apply whatever method you have. So I'm not real big on telling someone, use this method. The method is as long as it's humane and everything. The method isn't as important as much as how you apply it, because we've all seen people go to clinics and they learn the method, but they didn't apply it the same way that trainer did. And so now I can say, well, if that's so-and-so's method, it sucks. I'm, I don't like his method. Well, I might like that guy's method if I saw him do it. You know, I'm going to tell you some research I did. I'm going to try not to get too excited. And Kind of calm myself here, because this this <laughs> this gets me excited. There is a lady. Her name is uh, Dr. Frances Champagne, and at the time she did this, she was with Columbia University. But I can't swear that's where she is now. Um, I believe her research takes her whoever that type of research is going on. But uh, Frances Champagne and. Basically, her studies was human behavior and trying to figure out why uh, some of the children, they're raised, how they end up repeating some of the bad things that their parents do. So you, you may think, well, is this nature or nurture? Did they learn this or were they born this way? Because the mother was this way, this is the way they're going to be. Or was it just that they never had a chance to get out of the uh, the bad neighborhood, never had a chance other people had, you know. So was it just their environment? How she did her research, ironically, for humans is she used animals. So <laughs> here she's using it. So you can't argue, well, animals aren't people. So whatever research she does in animals doesn't apply to people. Well, wrong. You know, that's where the similarity comes into is we have lots of similarities. And we use it for our diet, testing stuff, things like that. So she's doing research and she's doing research with mice. And they noticed in the research we're doing with mice that there were some mothers, mother mice, that were good mothers. And there were some that weren't. They neglected their babies. But these nurtured and licked and uh, played with their babies and stuff. So they're thinking, well, this is hereditary. Uh, these babies grow up to be good mothers. And the babies raised out of the bad mother, they all, all of them, grew up to be bad mothers. And the others all grew up to be good mothers raised by the good mother. So you're thinking, yeah, this is very consistent, 100%. It's, uh, it's born in them. So then one time they did this experiment. They had two ba group of babies born at the same time, and they swapped babies. They took the babies out of the good mother and put it with the bad mother and the babies out of the bad mother and put them with the good mother. And so they raised them and the mothers were still bad. Mother was bad to those babies. Good mother was good to those babies. And then they grew up. They went on and became mothers. And what happened was the babies raised by the good mother turned out to be good mothers. But heredity said they should be bad because they came out of the bad mother. But they turned out to be good mothers. 
So now you're thinking, hmm, it's environment. And the babies that were raised out of the bad mother, they, they were, she raised the babies out of the good mother. So good babies raised by bad mother, they grew up to be bad mothers. So bad mothers turned out bad mothers. Good mothers turned out good mothers. And you're going, this is very consistent. So it must be learned. It's, it's nurtured. They, they've learned this through their environment. Wrong. <laughs> it goes back and forth. So she did further research, and what she eventually identified was the gene that made good mothers good. And the thing was, all mice have that gene. Even the bad mothers have that gene, but that gene isn't turned on by the bad mothers. So that's why the bad mother can have babies, but that gene wouldn't be turned on with them. When they swapped it over to a good mother and that good mother nurtured them, it turned that gene on. And now that gene is active and those babies went on to be good mothers. So it makes you makes me think, what other kind of genes are like that? What ones are turned on we maybe don't want turned on and what ones didn't get turned on that should have? So things that make us brave or make us confident or make us afraid of things, all kinds of uh, different things that we have that are good or bad, that uh, is either a gene that gets turned on or not turned on. And it really opens up a lot of questions. So in the end, good parenting holds out because good parents are also going to make you confident and brave and everything else. And so it's just raising that baby well. So that was their understanding of p people born, let's say, in poverty or in bad neighborhoods. Just raise that child correct. Give them love. Give them everything you can. Educate them. Help them out. Give them confidence. Give them the right activities to do. Just keep on them. And they are, because you see it all the time where people say, well, I was raised in poverty. Look at me now. And they've gone on to be doctors or researchers or um, celebrities in some way. They've come out of that and made something of themselves. Abraham Lincoln, you know, went on to become president, raised in a log cabin. So there's lots of things like that that are just so interesting when you're working with that horse and, and you're trying to go, what made you this way? Your first thought is, well, you've had some bad experiences, which a lot of times that could be so. But sometimes horses, some horses just have, they're more defensive. Some horses, uh, Arabians, they're in breeds. Arabians and thoroughbreds are a little hotter horses. Now, that's not a bad thing. It's just that's their characteristic, you know. So you need to learn to work with those things. Either if they're not to your advantage, maybe that isn't the breed you need to work with. But I've had lots of Arabians that were really quiet horses, you know, and thoroughbreds too. So it's easy to do the blame game where you're just saying, oh, this is why that horse is this way or that's why. But, you know, it's never too late to treat them right. It's never too late to start them down that good road, whether it's training or just their confidence and how you raise them and feed them. Uh, that's the other thing. If you're raised around drugs and maybe you're not given drugs as a child, but you're around that. That can affect how uh, your system in, in growing up, your diet. Your diet can affect you later on in life. So there's lots of factors besides just the behavior of your mom that dictates how you're going to be later in life. But uh, you can always start making it better right now. The very next second, you can start making it better. Just start making those changes. And whether it's you or your horse, your job, whatever you're doing, you can start making those changes and start things going down the right road. You mentioned podcasts earlier. I'm curious, have you ever listened to Dr. Jordan B. Peterson's podcast? Yes, I have. Uh, uh, not his podcast. I have listened to him. This probably isn't fair. 
I'm going to say it's fair because I agree with most of everything he says, but it isn't fair that I haven't listened to him in his entirety. But I, I have listened to different arguments and him debating different people. And uh, he is, it's, it's very sound common sense most of the time in things that he's, and it's so silly, I think, sometimes why people are arguing so hard with him going, this isn't that big a deal, you know? And you think he's a terrible person because he's standing up for what he believes in. Um, I have listened to him and think he does good work. I would encourage you, he has a podcast and particularly his his earliest couple of seasons of podcasts. He's much more psychologically oriented in those. uh, And he talks a lot about these sorts of research projects and things. Uh, For instance, one researcher found out that mice actually laugh. Mice and rats both laugh, but you have to listen to it on an ultra high frequency that the human hair doesn't pick up. But if you if you listen to it on that, you can tickle them with a pencil eraser and they'll laugh. There was a very famous Russian experiment. The Russians did all kinds of ex- experiments in the early 1900s where they were raising foxes for their pelts and they they were sick of the aggressive behavior of the foxes. So they devised a, a basically it was a leather glove on a pole and they had a, a little scoring system and they would stick the leather glove in the cage and they would score the foxes on how aggressively they handled the leather glove and they started selectively breeding for the gentler foxes just trying to make life easier in three generations all of the foxes turned blue it was not the sort of thing they were it, it was just like you're talking about genetics there there was apparently a linkage of genes between that color and the temperament that they were looking for and boom they they accidentally turned them blue a lot of what you're talking about is kind of the neurochemistry of the animals it it actually extends further than humans and animals even down into invertebrates you can give uh octopuses are are trained the same way you can give lobsters antidepressants and you will chemically change the brain of the lobster and they'll become more social (laughs) Uh, there there's just a ton of stuff that's uh, i find super interesting in a lot of those experiments so you've got i'm going to put out a a post asking for i I know i have a fairly science-based argument or audience because if they aren't into that kind of stuff they they got bored and quit listening to me a while ago so i'm going to put out a a post just for send me some other interesting research projects that you know of and i'll come across something cool i'll send it your way I, I would love that. Like I said, I I love to learn. And if I am always looking for, and I've got a couple little web things they send out, uh, science reports, and usually it's nothing I'm interested in. But sometimes there is some research that I'm going, oh, this is interesting. And so I you get to thumb through them and see which one you like. And, but I love that. So if you run across anything, Sure, send it my way. I'd, I'd love to look at it and read it. I I tell you something else that you with the foxes and the blue color. I'll, I'll tie this together, but I'm going to start off with people talk about the swirl in the forehead of the horse and the placement of it on whether they're a good horse or bad horse. Are you familiar with that? Yes, sir. Uh, you're nodding your head. Yes, <laughs> I'm familiar with it. I, and uh, I'll, I'll explain it for anyone that doesn't quite understand. It, it's a, a, a cowlick, and just like you have on the head of your hair or something. And um, it's you have uh, one, usually one, sometimes more, on the forehead of a horse and a mule and a burrow. And um, you'll also have some on the neck, on each side of the neck, on each side of the mane. And the old uh, wives' tale is, if it's in the right place, they're going to be a good horse. Now, the the place on the neck is the further up towards the ear, the better the horse. On the face, they want to see it right between the eyes. And sometimes it's a little higher, sometimes it's lower. Sometimes there's two or three, or it's elongated one. 
And there was actually a lady, and I never got the book, but I heard there was a lady that wrote a book on just the squirrels on a horse. I love to read that because I'm pretty sure I have some doubts on some of those things. It's, it's hard for me to say that this is an absolute, but it's almost like getting out an astrology book. I've probably offended people there, but I uh, read this article where they did this experiment and uh, at CSU, uh, Colorado State University, and these were older lesson horses. They brought them into a pen, like a round pen, and they had a bucket there with some feed, and the handler come up there and took the halter off and turned them loose so they could put their head down and eat that feed. When they would pick their head up, there's another person standing in front of them that would open an umbrella real quick and scare them, and the horse would dart off, and they took certain notes, like which direction they went, to the right or to the left, how far they went, how long it took them to come back to it. If they come back to it, you know, putting their head in there, do they have to just go right back to eating or are they hesitant, you know? So they took a lot of different notes. What they found out is all but one horse, this was consistent with that swirl. When it went one way, the horse always went to the left and it went the other way, they always went to the right all except for one horse. And so like 99% of the horses, and so they're going, there's something to that. Well, I ask people for years, usually I'd ask a veterinarian because they've had some education, but they're an equine vet, so they've got horse experience. Let's go, what's your belief on that swirl? Do you think there's any thought to it? They go, no, there's nothing to that. Well, now we have this research that's saying there is some that swirl does affect that horse some way. And all they're saying is that horse has a favored way, a tendency to go a certain way. That's all they're claiming there. But then I read this other research out of England, and I can't tell you everything about this except that they did research and they found out that that swirl had something to do with their temperament and color. So that's where you saying these foxes were blue after their temperament got better. So that's what reminded me of this is um, I'm going to have to get that out, read that again. But still, there is research that, again, said that swirl had an indication into the temperament of that horse. Now, all along, all these horsemen through the decades would say that swirl means something. And everyone's going, oh, you're just a, a layman. You don't know anything. You're not a scientist. Now, scientists do this research. And they find, and they're going, well, I'll have you know that squirrel means something. And we're all just going, we've known that, dude. You know, <laughs> it, now you just have proof, you know, but we've, we've known that. You're not telling us anything. But there, there are, and I'll tell you my thoughts on that. If you have where that squirrel is not in a good place, and, and so you would say, well, he's not a good horse. It's, that squirrel's not in the right place. That squirrel is one indicator. There's indicators all over this horse. So he may have 10 good indicators and that one bad. So just because that squirrel isn't in the right place doesn't mean your horse is bad. And I have found, and because I look at those squirrels, I found it to be true and I've found it not to be true on that squirrel on whether the horse is good or bad. Now you'll find on burrows and mules that that squirrel is halfway down the nose. And you'll also notice they have a different temperament and different way of going at them. Not good or bad, but just different. And I find that, I, I don't know if I've done enough. I've looked at hundreds of horses, but I don't know if I've done enough to say this is true or not. But I found that the lower the squirrel gets, sometimes more like a burrow they are, where they're just a little more cautious about reacting to something instead of like a, a a horse that is overreactive. And the higher it is, the more reactive they get. And they can be a little more volatile. I asked one old horseman here in town, this horse had two squirrels. And I said, what do you think that means? He goes, it's no bueno. <laughs> so he didn't think two squirrels was a good thing. It was my own personal horse and he was a very good horse. So 
uh, I took it with a grain of salt. I, it was a good horse. So there it wasn't true. Having two squirrels wasn't bad for this particular one. But there are lots of things like that that uh, you'll look at and go, hmm, I wonder if it's true. So if you just keep it in mind and look at them and look at hundreds and hundreds of different horses, you might get an idea. And, and that's what we do with our experiences. All the horses that I've seen that acted a certain way, when I see another horse act in that way, I have an idea that they're going to be like those horses. So we look at horses with their eye, their ear, the shape of their head, and you get a feel for what that horse is going to be. Everybody likes, everybody describes the same eye you want to see on a horse. Nice, big, round, soft eye and the placement of it. And that is true. Everybody believes that. Well, that's just another characteristic. It's a physical characteristic, just like that squirrel is. So if that eye can mean something, so can that squirrel. So uh, there's just so much research like that that you can do that is uh, stumble across that uh, fascinates me. Yeah, we and we certainly develop prejudices. I I have never been a Palomino fan. I have ridden probably 12 of them that were just very dumb. <laughs> and not that there's anything necessarily wrong with a dumb horse, but it just, you know, that when you're in that time crunch of of training, sometimes you're like, you know, hey, these other eight are coming along real good. This one's really slow. But uh, there definitely are exceptions. I've got a Palomino in training right now that I like pretty well. But it, it's kind of funny how it's it's which of those few horses that come across that make an impression are the ones that lead to your belief or bias in, in this direction. You really have to look at those hundreds before you get where it doesn't matter. But I got a question for you. If you're flipping a coin and you flipped it nine times and nine times it's come up heads, what are the odds the next time you flipped it, it'll come up heads? Exactly the same as it was every time you flipped it. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> if, yeah. That's the same odds that the very next Palomino you ride is going to be good or bad. You may mm -hmm. have had nine or ten in a row that were bad, but the next one is 50-50 if he's going to be good or bad. Um, yes, color, colors, yeah, you may have lots of experience with a certain color, maybe positive or negative, but I don't hold too much on the color. I look more for the confirmation. And obviously, I've been fooled by confirmation. I had, I had a horse come in, had a little bitty eye, uh, Roman nose, did not great confirmation. And this guy sent me six horses to ride. And I thought, oh, that one got the short end of the stick. But, uh, you know, I'll start them all. I rode them all. And, and that horse did well. And when they got him back, they liked that horse the best because they could put anybody on him. He was very consistent. He was nice, kind. Everybody loved that horse. And, and so they thought that was the best. Now, there's other horses in there that were more athletic. But not everybody was wanting to ride a horse that could slide and spin. Some of them just wanted to go trail ride. So... The things you want may or like in a horse may not be what somebody else likes in a horse. But sure. uh, you can't always tell the book, you know, by its cover. It's it's a good indication. And I, I take it, but I take it with a grain of salt. Yes, sir. Do you have any preference on mares, gelding, stallions, or anything like that? Stallions, you have to just, you're working around that, those hormones. And... You have to make allowance for that. Some are get to be a little studier than others, and some act just like gildings. <clears throat> so sometimes there's a little more work involved in where you put them, stable them, who you keep them with, uh, what you're doing with them and everything. But um, they're all individuals, just like everything else. Gildings are the most consistent. Sometimes I think mares might be a hair smarter, but uh, I really don't have too big a preference there. I hate a stud kept a stud just so somebody says I own a stud. 
Otherwise, I don't mind stats. But but when they go, oh, we just thought if he ever amounts to anything, you know, we, we could breed him. And, you know, he's not going to be a breeding horse. But before you wind things up completely, I've got a little short list of principles I think people should think about when they're training their horses. Excellent. Now, you can talk about, you ask me questions on them, but there's about 10. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you, and then if you want to go back over any of them. And like we've talked about some of these already. And the first one is, is just a basic training principle of remove the fear and get control. So we've already talked about that. Then we also talked about you need to create a learning frame of mind, have that horse in the best frame of mind for learning. You as a person need to pay attention to the little things because it's anybody can learn the big things. What separates you and will make you better is when you start paying attention to the smaller details. You, you pay attention to the smaller stuff, the big stuff will take care of itself. And then when you teach the horse, again, we talked about this a little bit, is you're just going to teach them to give in to pressure. Just one thing, you're just going to keep teaching them to give in different ways. What a lot of people do is they fix, they try to work on the problem, and they need to fix what's causing the problem. And I mentioned about a horse that rears up. You know, there's lots of reasons why a horse should rear up. Uh, if you're trying to turn a horse around and he turns to the right but not to the left, you can't just beat them up because, well, you'll go that way. Why won't you go this way? And so you just try to force it. Well, there could be lots of reasons. He could be sore. He could not have had as much practice that way. There, there could be other factors involved in why he may not do something. So you want to find out why. Again, with the mouth problems like rearing, uh, somebody else could have jerked on that horse. Uh, maybe he's got a tooth problem. Uh, maybe you've got too much bit on him. There could be lots of reasons. So if you have different things that cause it, then there's different ways to fix it. So you wouldn't just go in there and float his teeth and keep using the same bit, and then the horse just keeps rearing up. It, it just a fix doesn't cure it. You want to fix what's causing the problem. So sometimes you have to be a little bit of a Sherlock Holmes to deduct what is actually causing the problem. But that's what you need to do is fix what's causing the problem. Use positive reinforcement as much as possible. It's, it, it's not that you wouldn't ever use negative reinforcement. Well, when you tell people it's okay to use negative reinforcement, it gives some of them a license to go ahead and hit their horse. Let's just get a club and, or let's just jerk on them uh, because negative reinforcement works. Just because it, it, a deterrent is way different than punishment. Both are negative reinforcement. So you may give him a, ter a deterrent not to do something, but you don't have to give him the big hard punishment. So you wouldn't club him over the head. You may just block him from going some way. So. You can use negative reinforcement, make it small, but you're better off giving them positive reinforcement. And if you don't think that works good, how do you want to be trained? Do you want so, to be trained by people encouraging you? Or do you want to be encouraged by always telling you you're messing up and you're wrong and, and they come down harder and harder on you for doing it the wrong way? So the positive reinforcement works. Now, Clicker training, are you familiar with clicker training? Very, yes, sir. Okay. That is nothing but positive reinforcement. And that is not practical in most of the horse show world and the work world. Because if a horse doesn't want to do something, you can sit and click that thing all you want. He's going, nah, I don't think so. You know? And so it, the training takes a lot longer. And if you ever run across a roadblock, it takes a long time. It's not that you can't get them to do it with it. 
It just, you have to stop everything till you get there. Or sometimes by just encouraging them to try a little harder works. So positive training always works, but sometimes it's not always practical to do strictly positive. Sometimes you have to use that deterrent where you just go, you just tell them no, don't go that way, but you're not beating them for going the wrong way. There's a huge difference in the negative reinforcement. And most people, once you say it's okay, they go all the way. The other thing is about patience. You know, what patience is, if you tell someone to have patience, you're telling them to wait. You don't have to have patience to wait. All you have to do is wait. Just wait. You know, your mother telling you, well, count to 10. I got told that. I It's a little volatile sometimes. My mom tell me, I want you to count to 10 before you react. And it took a long time, but actually started doing that. But in doing something with a horse, people are waiting and uh, they get tired of waiting. And uh, loading a horse is a good example. You rush them, the more you rush them, it doesn't get them over their fear. They just get where they want to run backwards more. But when people watch me go to load a horse and I go up there and I'm doing nothing, just standing there, they're going, well, you know, come on, let's go. Are you going to do something? I go, I'm doing it, you know. <laughs> but <laughs> they're impatient, and they're just wanting him to get in quick. And I tell them he will get in quick, just not this first time. Maybe not the second time, but it's going to get quicker if you take the time the first time. So that patience is really hard. And I've had times where people will tell me I'm really being patient, and inside I'm going, no, I'm not. I'm not being patient. I, my Inside, I'm going, come on, come on. But outside, I'm just standing there doing nothing because I'm going, it takes the time it takes. It, You can't rush it. it, it if you rush it, it's going to blow up in your face. So sometimes you can be impatient, but just still wait. You can't, everybody can't be comfortable doing nothing. That's all right if you're not comfortable. But you still have to wait. Just stand there and wait. Put put a little act on and act like you're bored and and uh, just wait. A big mistake people make is they're not consistent. So they may tell a stud, you know, don't bite, don't bite. And then they go and feed them out of their hand a treat. You know, well, now the horse gets looking for the treat and he gets mouthy. You may tell the horse when I'm riding you, you cannot put your head down and eat grass. But then you stop and you're visiting with someone. And he wants to eat grass. Oh, well, I'm not going anywhere. Go ahead and eat. That's not consistent. You have to be consistent in your training. You have to be consistent with your cues. And when you're asking him, you can't be um, like if you cluck or kiss to a horse to get him to go. You can't just be doing that all the time. They get to where they ignore it. You know, uh, if you use a lunge whip, you can't just be waving it, and waving it, and waving it because you're taking the power away from that. Now you're actually going to have to hit them because it's not scaring them anymore. So you need to, you know, use your reinforcement correctly, but be consistent. Be consistent in how you ask a horse. And if you ask them something, ask them the same way every time so it does not confuse them. Because that confusion is a very short step away from fear. You get them confused enough, and they're going to just go, I don't know what's going on, but I'm out of here. So remove that confusion and, and try to be as consistent as possible. And if you get mad, now's a good time to take a time out. And this is where my mother's, you know, count to 10. But seriously, if, if, you, if you're riding your horse, maybe if you can't sit on them and quit picking on them, just get off and tie them up. Go ride another one. You know, go get something to drink. Go clean a stall. Give it a break. When you come back, he'll have calmed down a little bit. You'll have calmed down a little bit. You've probably thought about how things are going. And you can start back off and start back off a little slower with something simpler just to get that horse starting to tell you yes again instead of no, no, no. 
when you're training, when you're mad, you will overdo the punishment. Now you're going to punish till you feel better. And sometimes all you need is just one kick, but you're so mad you kick, 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 and then maybe jerk on the reins a couple times, you know. But when you're mad, you will overdo it. You won't give them the amount that, that is necessary. And you need to give only as much as necessary, but enough that gets whatever you're doing done. So don't train mad. Take a break. Tie them up. Come, come back to them. You don't have to quit and never ride them again or quit that day. But take a break. And the last thing is have fun. The last thing I tell people, you got to have fun when you're out there. You got to be enjoying it. And it makes all the difference in the world when you're enjoying what you're doing and enjoying the process. If you're teaching, you got to enjoy the process of teaching. If you're doing an activity, uh, roping or the trail riding or, you know, some people go and that's where they like to gossip. They go along and they just talk about stuff. You know, that's great. Go and enjoy it. But you don't really like talking, then why would you want to go riding with a bunch of people? You know, <laughs> go riding by yourself. So do stuff that do it that makes you happy. The training should make you happy. The riding, the event, the discipline. You need to find a way to enjoy yourself and have fun with it. And those 10 things will usually make your training program go better. I do have a question for you in there on your sixth one you talked about using positive reinforcement as much as possible and you, you talked about clicker training there I, I i think you might have misspoken on the negative reinforcement part so i just wanted to clarify so technically in in the behavioral terms of operant conditioning positive and negative only mean addition and subtraction so negative reinforcement means you remove something to reinforce a behavior positive reinforcement just means you add something to reinforce a behavior so negative reinforcement is essentially feel um, anytime we're given a horse a physical cue that involves pressure and release that is textbook negative reinforcement would you like to say something there yeah, there's actually three types of negative reinforcement. And there's one that is just punishment. And punishment is what I was talking about, where you're just doing it to make you feel better. The horse is not learning anything from it. Yes. You're, just, so, you're just beating it. Then there, so the, there is... Uh, go ahead. I was just going to say that that's the other half of the quadrant. There, there's positive and negative on the on one axis, and then there's punishment and reinforcement on the other. So you have positive punishment and reinforcement and negative punishment and, and reinforcement. I, I think what you were mostly talking about where you're beating on a horse, that's a, that's positive punishment because you're, you're adding something in order to punish the behavior. Yeah. But yeah. I don't mean uh, to interrupt I, you. No, no, no. You're technically correct. I just put them in two categories where – it is something that it, the horse is going to want to do because of the positive reinforcement that you're doing or something they're not going to want to do because of the negative reinforcement. It's something that they didn't like. But the three types of way that is the negative reinforcement is the punishment. And then there's the escape. Like you don't give him any kind of cue or anything like spurring a horse. You just spur him and he, he knows he runs off. The spurs come out of it. So he's just escaping. And the third way is what most training is used. It's avoidance training. So you would cluck and then use your spur. The horse would go. Eventually you would cluck and the horse wants to avoid the spur. So he goes. So that would be avoidance training when you allow him to avoid something. And a lot of training is done through that avoidance method so but i put those three things as negative reinforcement in my head i do believe that you haven't categorized correctly though sure and it's all just an organizational structure you can you can organize it in any any way you want i just i know that the use of positive and negative 
within behavioral context is is one of the most accidentally misunderstood or or misstated things that we have because it's so easy to mean pleasant and say positive and it's so easy to mean unpleasant and say negative but that just isn't what they actually mean in in those contexts so that's that's really what i always try to do when i when i mean pleasant i try to say ple- and there's that's the problem there's there's no real good synonym for negative unpleasant's about the best i've come up with but if you ever come up with a better word i, I would love to hear it um i'd like and to share with you what, that's why when i was saying negative reinforcement negative doesn't always mean you beat the horse it isn't how that makes it means it's really negative as opposed yeah. to just a deterrent where it's it's just uncomfortable to do it that way. It's just easier to do it the other way. So negative reinforcement can be very mild where you're just saying, no, nope, no, nope, not that way. And then as soon as they choose the other way, you go, there you are. Mm-hmm. You know, and so then they pick the other way. So negative reinforcement is always used and there's nothing wrong with it unless you abuse it. Yes, sir. And I've always thought that that statement, make the right thing easy and the wrong thing difficult, that's really a textbook mm-hmm. example of negative reinforcement. Um, you know, it's mm-hmm. you, I call it the hot or cold game. You're you're getting colder, you're getting warmer. That's kind of how I describe feel. You know, you're you're getting closer to the goal, and, and I'm the, backing off. That's the shaping we talked about. You know, hotter or colder. Because I use that same example in talking to people. They're waiting for a big move, and they may have to wait for a little move, just an indication the horse starts to think that's what you want, you have to encourage it because that's where you start going, oh, you're a little warmer. Oh, now you're warm. Yeah, you're getting warm. Oh, now you're hot. Now you're really encouraging them. Once they know that's the right way, and that's what that feel does, when you can feel that little bit of movement, you need to go, yeah, yeah, that's the way to go. And you need, and the reward for going in the right way will be real small. And they're giving you an indication that's real small, but you'll build on both of it. And pretty soon it'll be easier to feel. And uh, the horse will then get very, that's again, where you need to be consistent. Every time he makes the slightest move that way, you reward him going, yes, that's the right way. You're warmer. And then he'll catch on quickly. Sometimes we miss it. And uh, it confuses the horse. Well, sometimes it's warm, sometimes it's not. And, and even and even those of us at a higher level miss little things here and there all the time, right? That it's a fair thing that we still make mistakes too. And and uh, I know I misjudge horses sometimes. I, I thought he was going to handle that better. Turns out I pushed him a little too hard, or or whatever. It, it still happens even when you do have a lot of experience. That's part of the. I really feel like a lot of people need the permission to realize that it's okay to make mistakes because you never get to a point where you don't make any, you're always still self-correcting yourself and realizing you could have done that a little bit better. As you get to be a better better professional, you make fewer mistakes and they're smaller. But if you ever say you don't make any mistakes, I don't know that person. Mistakes are going to be made, but you might not even notice a, a real good hand out there doing something and making a mistake. But that's what the experience does. And you working on yourself and your skills is your mistakes are going to be fewer and they're going to be smaller. So you just ste- just keep working on it. Just keep working on it. Yes, sir. One thing I wanted to share with you, I had kind of an epiphany a few years ago regarding positive reinforcement. And I I did play with it a bit in the pure sense of using treats and an actual clicker. Or I didn't use treats. I just used their feed or an alfalfa pellet. I never went to a true treat. But like you, I found the clicker itself to be very impractical because I I need two hands for a lot of things or I'm handling a rope or something like that. and, And, you know, it's just very awkward. So the epiphany that I had was that all the clicker really is in technical terms that we call it a bridging signal but all it really does is mark the exact spot so it really plays a larger role in timing than anything else and i was i was doing a deal with a lot of my customers i i, I try to work with a lot of them especially those that want to become more technical on feeling the horse's feet 
and we do a little exercise where they just walk in circles around me and I call out the timing of a certain foot when it hits the ground or when it's breaking over. And, and I just use the word there, 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 and let them get in time and feel it. And then they start saying it with me. And then I get quiet and we see if they can continue to say there in time with the foot and, and so forth. And we do that to work on their timing until they know where all four feet are and, and so forth. So I was already using the word there to mark the time there. And I started using that in place of the clicker. So whenever a horse does something exactly right, I just I try to consciously say there and kind of mark the spot. And then even without using the food treats, if I'm just timing that with my negative reinforcement, my release of the rain or my leg or whatever the the stimulus was, I have found that they definitely pick up on that. And I can start to cue the relaxation signals off of the word there with my horse. So make them take a deep breath, make them lick and chew and lower the head and all those things that, that tell us they're, they're technically getting a dopamine release in the brain. Uh, and I found that to be a pretty big help, a little bit of a boost. I kind of get, get double reinforcing signals there, the, the rain or whatever the direct aid is, and then the verbal overlay. Another another part that I and I, I hesitate a little bit to talk about this because I haven't I haven't found corroborating research. This is kind of a single point of data that I've got. I've really been wanting to talk with Dr. Steve Peters on this and maybe he can corroborate it with me. But there is a, a point in the a part of the brain called the striatum. And that is where dopamine, the, the neurotransmitter hormone chemical of reinforcement works in the brain and it's it has three layers to it and according to this the first layer of it is where we get the dopamine releases after and those are the real obvious signs that the horses give to us and i call them kind of the light bulb moment so that's when the horse you've been struggling they're working on something they finally figure it out you give them a big release you let them soak and they let down, their head goes down, they lick and chew, they take the deep breath, and they can't, that's that moment we're all working hard for and we cherish, and you absolutely don't distract that horse in that moment, you know. But the really interesting part of it to me is that once the horse learns the cue, once the, the, the neurons, the neuroplasticity is set and you've made the neural connections in the brain, and they become very familiar with the cue. They actually start to get the dopamine hit in the second part of the striatum at the time of the cue. So they're they're reinforced because they know that they already know the answer. And to me, that that's really cool because that means in our open horses and stuff, when we're starting to set them up to do whatever and they're a pro and they know it, we're actually giving them reinforcement simply by asking them to do this thing that they already know. And and I think that like the Border Collie you were talking about or, or the Belgian Malinois, the lab, that dog that is just sitting there in anticipation, shaking, knowing you're about to say come by or whatever, and they just can't wait for you to let them loose. I think that's what we're seeing right there is that that central part of the striatum at work and they're getting the dopamine right here and now in anticipation of what's coming. And I find the timing of that change to be very interesting. And then the third part of the striatum is actually where we get into a misuse of dopamine. And that's the, the part where addiction occurs. So if you look up the striatum in research, you go on Google Scholar or some, almost everything you're going to pull up is going to deal with alcoholism or some form of addiction. Uh, but in horses, that correlates with what we call the stereotypic behavior. So cribbing and stall weaving and, and things like that. Those are actually cases of horses that have their brain is misusing dopamine and they're getting they're giving themselves have found a way to give themselves hits of dopamine in ways that are unproductive. And they, they come up with these various vices like cribbing or stall weaving or walking the fence line or whatever it may be. So I don't know if you find that interesting, but I find I'm I'm waiting on something to corroborate that where I can really start you, talking about it in public more. You hit several points there. And uh, I'll tell you, 
the difference when you're talking about the horse and where he receives that reward, whether he gets the reward as he does it or he gets the reward knowing he has the right answer before he does it. That comes down to whether that horse knows that job or not. So if he knows the job and he knows the answer, then he will get it early. And you got to be consistent and always giving it. So then he will get it earlier. Because this is, again, it depends. There's a lot of things that depend on this. So a horse that isn't sure of the answer and he's not sure he's going to get the reward every time, that dopamine isn't going to take effect until the reward and, and afterwards. Now he's getting the, the benefit of that dopamine. So it depends on the level of education that that horse has in order for that to work. So you can't say it works one way or the other way. It, work, it works differently depending on the level of his training. Does that make yes, sense? Sir. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, that, that's that's exactly what I'm saying. There, there's there's kind of definitive proof along with the place it's happening and how it happens about or I say definitive again, it's a, it's a one of one kind of a thing right now, but I just find that infinitely interesting. And the whole, like you have kind of these anti people that think we shouldn't be riding horses. Well, here's proof that you can give a horse a, a dopamine release in their brain and a reward by giving him his job and showing him how to do it. And he'll actually anticipate and look forward to, and it'll become a meaningful thing in his life just if we anthropomorphize exactly the same way that it happens in the human brain. Well, I don't know so much about uh, dopamine in the last, what was the last thing you said about it where, I'm sorry. Um, the, the striatum or the the anthropomorphism? Where they were, oh, the stall weaving and stuff is, is yes, sir. what it was. Yeah. Did you hear my brain click it? It was working overtime trying to remember that. <laughs> that I never thought of it that way, but I thought the same thing that you're saying is that that horse is so bored. It's it's the same thing that uh, you've seen. I've seen videos of children in uh, wards where they're refined to their bed, like adoption places in Russia, and they just have to sit in their bed, and they sit there and they weave back and forth, and they're doing something that makes them feel comfortable, and that comfortable feeling gives them that dopamine. I never thought of it in terms of they're getting the dopamine. I just Mm -hmm. thought of it in terms as they cannot sit there. It's driving them crazier to sit there and do absolutely nothing. So they're doing something to give them that feeling of, I, I don't know if you'd want to say accomplishment or at least of them feeling comfortable because they're mm-hmm. controlling the weaving or like with horses, the cribbing, the flapping of the lips and things like that. But, you know, we do the same thing. We have bad habits that uh, we do at different times. Yes, and uh, people do uh, unconsciously until you say something, you go, oh, yeah, I got, I got to stop that. Even people do that. So it isn't a matter of how intelligent you are. It's a matter of you can't take what you're doing and you're trying to find that comfortable place in your brain and to give you that comfortable feeling. And uh, the, the weaving and cribbing will, will do that. It'll give them that feeling. Yes, sir. In, in psychology, I think they refer to those as self-soothing behaviors. That can happen a lot of times when people get uncomfortable and they cross their arms. This is essentially you giving yourself a hug to comfort yourself and stuff. So there are a lot of, uh, I've studied a lot oh, of body language that. stuff in people. I do it to give myself a hug. I do it to keep from hitting the other person. <laughs> that, that's what I'm doing. So I don't, if you ever see me come undone, you better duck. <laughs> but I don't do this to hug myself. <laughs> But anyway, when we have like cribbing and things in horse, that that is, as far as the brain goes, that's the same thing as alcoholism or, or methamphetamine or in, any other type of chemical addiction that the animal would get into. They've just managed to do it without the exterior drug. They've, they've done it internally, but, but they're literally in an addictive pattern as far as the brain goes. Exactly the same 
uh, stuff is going on there. Had, if they had some outside activity, they would never get to that spot where they had to weave. They would be comfortable standing still and relaxing, whether it's in a stall or outside or whatever. Uh, same with cribbing. They'll get over cribbing, put them out in the pasture, and usually they put their head down and if it's got a good grassy area. And they're continually having to move, not stand in one place and eat. They they will move and move with the other horses and continue to eat. And they'll never think about cribbing because they have other activities going on. They've got life replacing that uh, thing that they're doing to give them the same frame of mind, something interesting going on. Yes, sir. So, yeah. Well, I guess uh, the last. Yeah, go ahead. I was, do you need to leave? You sound like you were about to say something. No, no. Okay. I'm going to ask you a question, but you go first. Well, the, the last thing I was going to bring up is, is with regard to this research and the psychology, sort of the, the, the newer, younger wave of clinicians, it's, it's now the thing to, to talk about all of this leadership stuff being debunked. And I, w- I would guess that you're kind of a, believing in leadership and how important it is to horses kind of guy. And I'm certainly that way as well. And and when you were talking, we were discussing the desensitizing and you were talking about making a horse more brave and, and, and getting them where they're, you don't push them too far. You, you're drawing them out of their shell and bringing about confidence. To me, what, what you were discussing there is the essence of what I think of when I think of leadership. Whenever it's also very in vogue to talk about having a connection with your horse and and these sorts of things, and to me that's how you build a connection with your horse. It isn't by scratching him out in the pasture or giving him his favorite treat. It's by being an integral integral part of that horse overcoming challenges, so that they now know they can turn to you when it gets difficult, when it gets hard. They're braver, but you're also part of a team because you coached them through that scary thing and made them braver. And to me, that is the most solid way to build that connection with a horse and the epitome of what I think of when I think of leadership. So I just wanted to ask your thoughts on that. Yeah, I'm, I'm dying. I'm chomping at the bit here. (laughs) But what we do is we put terms out there and then people use their definition of that term. So we had people that say, I don't want a slave. I want a partner as a horse. And uh, I never liked that. I think it's a nice thought. But in a partnership, if it's 50-50, that means you're going to decide half the time and I'm going to decide the other half the time. And that's that's not what you want. You don't want him deciding, no, nah, today we're not going to do that. You know? so. The definition of a partner is that, is is that you're equal, you're equal partners. Um, so I don't like how we put terms up there and then different people use their own definition of these different terms. And so the leadership, if you're talking about being a leader, some people are going to take that and go, I got to show him who's the boss. That's what they used to say. Show him who's boss. Don't let him get away with it. And all they wanted you to do was thump on, you know, that was, that was your cue to just beat them up. And that isn't what leaders do. <laughs> leaders don't just beat the subordinates. So I, I, I really hate the different terms that we use because I believe they get misused. So it's, it, uh, we're all struggling for what is that relationship you want with your horse? And it, the bottom line is there are lots of different kinds, same as kids have different relationships with their parents. And there are people who train and train through fear, and they don't care what the horse thinks or wants to do or can do. They want them to just try harder to do what they want. So they're, they are just no concern for the horse whatsoever. And it is only what they want. They figure they are they are the leader, and what I say goes, and you you better do it. That's not the leader. You know, what kind of leader do you want? That's what, because when you say leader, 
there's several different kinds of leaders. And some people, like I was reading a story about these Texas Rangers, and this guy said, uh, you know, I won't send you into battle. I'll lead you into battle. And because this guy said, I'm not going to send you there to fight and do what I say. I'm going to go in front of you and you guys follow me. That's all I'm asking you to do. Because of that, these guys would do anything that guy said. That's a completely different leader than the captain that says, you guys go out there and, and fire, you know, never mind the machine gun. I just want you to charge. That's, that's not a very good leader. You know, that's someone taking charge and giving orders. But it, it's not leading. And see, that's what other people do is they, they go, well, leading is this where you got, God, get away, away from the definition. You take it so literally sometimes. I just find fault with some of the ways people go to express it. You, you need to be a little bit open-minded and, and flexible in how people are saying things and what they mean. Because they could, uh, I think I made the comment to you about Ray Hunt said, I will be the horse's lawyer and I'll prove you wrong every time. And uh, he will defend the horse because people come there and say, well, my horse is stupid. My horse can't, just can't do this. My horse won't try. And they did nothing but blame the horse. Well, that's what we all do. We, in anything we do in life, it's not our fault. It's everybody else's fault. And so that's what these people are doing with the horse. And Ray really got tired of that. And so he had a very good argument. But um, the horse is not always right. Now, I believe what Ray says, that the, that horse needs to be defended. He needs to be treated correctly. And he needs to be asked the right way and given a chance to learn it. You know, then the horse will do it. And now... The horse isn't a bad horse. Oh, well, he's a good horse. Well, he isn't a good horse just because he's doing it, and he's a bad horse because he's not doing it. It has to do with the education part of it and whether he knows how to do it and is willing to do it. So there's things that people will say, and I just go, well, if you take that literally, which a lot of people do, they take it literally. This is what they mean. And I'm going, oh, no, they're just trying to, you know, make a point, you know. And so you got to be a little flexible with what they're saying. Leadership is really you're making the decisions, but your responsibility is to make the decisions to help the horse, not make the horse. You're helping him learn it. You're helping him do it, but you're not making him. Otherwise, you just need to get a bigger club if you're just going to make it. Sharper skill, spurs, bigger club, then you can make them do it. But if you're trying to help that horse, you're trying to teach the horse, that's completely different. And as a leader, you are supposed to help the horse through those difficult times, not just get mad at the horse, punish him, or just think he's stupid. You know, we're all stupid until we get it. You know, <laughs> there's a lot of things I don't understand. And then I go, oh, I got it now. But sometimes people just had to explain it differently to me. And that's the same with training. Is sometimes trainers just have to go, well, that's not working. Let me try a different way. And you explain it in a way that makes sense to them. They're going, oh, OK, well, I can do that. You know, and again, that would be a good leader. He sees that you're not getting it. So he needs to help you not in what he considers his strict program, but in whatever way helps you the best way. So he may have different methods to get you to the spot where he wants to go. Well, I always think with, with Ray Hunt that, you know, he, he was giving that message to a certain audience in a certain point in time. And his audience was largely cowboys and people that had been around horses and ranching. And in in that point in time, that was a fairly rough experience for the horse. That was a point where gentling one might mean tying him to a post for three days without water and then walking him up up to him with a bucket of water. And, and now he's finally glad to see you. And, and practices like that were a lot more common. Now we have 
60 year old women that are empty nesters that bought a horse and and we're giving them the same message and and it's a very different audience <laughs> and so i think yeah. I, uh, i'd like to say that i wasn't picking on ray hunt in that example no, no. i was picking on people that are taking his what he's saying literally mm -hmm. and just think the horse is always right he's always right. no he's gonna make wrong decisions but it depends on what the people do are doing when that horse makes the wrong decision and you need yeah. to help that horse through that. But it isn't Ray Hunt wasn't saying the wrong thing. It was just people take it so literally that you, you, you go, well, that's, he's making a point. He isn't meaning you to follow that to the letter, you know? Yes. Sir. So, and I, I guess I'm just, I, I, I didn't think that you were saying anything derogatory about him. I was just meaning if, if Ray Hunt were standing here right now, the message that he gives to this person with their horse and that person with their horse might not be the same message. So depending, it, it depends, right? It's all on the situation. Some people need to back off of the horse and give the horse a chance and, and the horse needs a lawyer. So he's got a defense and then other people, maybe need to prosecute that horse a little bit more. And and I think we have a lot more of those situations nowadays than what we had uh, 50 or 60 years ago when he was running the roads and, and doing his thing, uh, at least within the context of the people that I work with. I see a lot of people that are there. There's a movement now. I don't know if you've come across this, but in, in the positive reinforcement world, one of the big words now is consent. Uh, the horse has to, according to them, the horse has to give you their consent. And so maybe we don't train today at all. If I go out to the paddock and Sugar doesn't give me her consent today, then then Sugar doesn't want to work today and we're just going to leave Sugar alone. And and that's kind of that partnership that you were talking about. That, that has no place in my world. I, I may need Sugar to go get the cows off the highway because the state trooper is going to start shooting them in five minutes. And Sugar doesn't have a choice. Sugar needs to man up and, and go. We got things to do, you know, so. Are you going to, when you ask your kid to take the trash out, are you going to wait for his consent? Mm -hmm. Or are you going to say, hey, just go take the trash out, you know, and uh, yes. the, the consent is getting uh, too far the other way. Everything, everything we do has a balance to it. So, yes, we have been too hard and too inconsiderate to the horse, but you cannot fix it by going too far the other way and checking with him to make sure it's all right. You know, um, I don't I work for a living because people say, oh, you got that horse hot and sweaty. Yeah, there's people that go get hot and sweaty, not just for enjoyment or for a run, but for work. I mean, it's work. They work to earn money to so they can live. This is something they do. And sweating is not bad. You know, it's, it's doing some work is not a terrible thing. So I, I think some people carry it too far the other way. I run across several of those people and they're uh, very, they don't even want to hear your reasoning that you're just wrong and everything you say is wrong because because you cannot possibly be as nice and considered as they are there, there's they just can't even imagine it so but there's a balance there's there's a time for work there's too much work there's a a time you know to feed and a time where you're feeding too much Everything you do has a balance to it. And so when you say, well, you got to get after them, what does that mean? To you, it may mean, you know, whipping spurs. And to someone else, it may mean that, uh, you know, you're, you're going to just kind of cluck and start squeezing your legs a little bit. You know, it, like, no, I'm getting after them. I'm asking them. Well, one is like pretty light. And one's pretty heavy. It might be the answer is somewhere in the middle. So, again, it depends. You know, it depends on what's going on. But when somebody just says that, well, you have to get after them. Depending on how you understood it in another horse, it's how you're going to apply it this time. And it might be too much or too little. So you, you have to, anytime you're making those decisions, you would think it's common sense. But you have to take a step back and just think, well, what does this mean? And sometimes we just get so literal with, definitions that we don't really get the point of what 
the saying is or what the person means by it. So, but no, I, uh, uh, there, there's times I tell the horse, well, that's, that's tough, but I don't beat them up. I, I say, you got to try, mm-hmm. you know, try well, like uh, crossing water or loading the trade or getting, you get, you got to put a little effort down, you know, come on, let me, let me see you try. He puts his head down and looks going, okay, I can take the pressure off. But if, they uh, are looking around and backing away. I'm going, oh, you really need to put a little effort in here. So there's a time to say try, and there's a time to leave them alone. And you can't, uh, if you listen to what some people say and take it literally, you may never get a horse trained. Yes, sir. It, you, you, there's a lot of interpretation in there. Well, uh I don't know if you have anything else you'd like to say to, to wrap things up. I've got about all the questions asked and I've taken a, a we've gone about three hours. I don't know if uh, you realize that or not. That's more of your time that I intended to monopolize here. So uh, do you have anything else you'd like to, to say before we wrap it up? No, I think we've probably bored the people enough. We, we got them to hang around for three hours. We might not make three hours and 10 minutes. So. We probably should quit here. Well, I I certainly thank you for your time and and coming on. And it's been a pleasure to chat with you as always. I hope we get to ride together somewhere down the road at some event or something like that. And uh, I really appreciate you coming on and everything. If you'll hang on just a second after we, we stop officially, I wanted to talk to you for just a second. I want to thank you, uh, not for having me on, but for doing this type of show because this is what I, I feel that is good information that people can listen to and they can pick and choose different topics that they like, but they'll be surprised that they'll hit on something going, oh, I always wondered about that. And that's the day and age we live in is there's opportunities like this, like a podcast to tune in and find out something you don't know. And it might help you through a tough spot. So I think you're doing a, a service uh, to the general public. I don't know if it'll cause world peace, but it ain't going to hurt any. So thank you. Yes, sir. Well, thank you. <laughs> we'll see you next week for another episode of Adult Onset Horsemanship. I've been your host, Daniel Dolphin. <laughs>